Hello and welcome to day two of the PC Gamer Weekend uh, live stream. My name is Chris Thurston and I'm joined today by PC Gamer editor Sam Roberts and PCGamer.com editor Tom Senior. Hello. Now before we start, I'm going to run you through the day's schedule, which is also available right down there if you click the more info button on the description. So today coming up, in half an hour we've got Simon from Creative Assembly, who's a battle designer on Total War Warhammer, to talk us through their work on that game, which is here at the show, and people are playing it kind of en masse, as far as I can tell. After that, we have Charles Cecil, who's a legendary British adventure game designer responsible for the Broken Sword series, who will be kind of revealing a, a cool thing he's got coming up about the, the history of his work in this industry, and we'll be talking to him a little bit about his career. After that, we have Democracy 3 Africa, which is a really fascinating indie game about that attempts to politically simulate the African continent in, to an extraordinary degree of detail. We've got Jeff from Starbreezy to talk about that. After that, we'll be talking to Relic about the latest updates to Dawn of War 2 Retribution, which has showed up on this show as a, with, with a brand new thing five years, I think, after the release of Retribution. And Tom, I know you, you've spent some time with that game. Oh, yes. It's the last stand mode specifically, which is Yeah, there, which is the thing that... Yeah, three, versus, three heroes versus infinite hordes of weird creatures. We'll get to that in a sec. It's worth pointing out, if you saw the schedule prior to today, that's a little bit of a change. We did have NVIDIA in that slot. They're not going to be attending anymore. So Relic have sort of, have sort of stepped into the breach there, but I'm really excited about what they've got to show us. Then we have Chris from Wargaming to talk about Masters of Orion, which is this kind of uh, the resurrection of a really well-loved grand strategy franchise. And then finally, you ask for it, you ask for it repeatedly. You ask for it over and over and over again, even though the schedule has literally never changed <laughs> since we set this schedule a week ago. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord will be here, Tail World guys, to show it off on the stream for a full 40 minutes to round out the day. Everything they've shown elsewhere at this event, we're going to have all of it, hopefully, in the highest quality you've seen it on YouTube. <laughs> Thanks to whoever filmed it off the stage yesterday. So, that's our schedule for the day. What have you guys seen yesterday? Like, I've, I've been pretty much, you know, locked in, in my heavily branded chamber. But you guys have had a chance to explore the show a little bit and see some of the things that people are playing and maybe have your own first experiences of some of these games. So, Sam. Yeah, like, uh, I've, uh, yesterday I didn't get loads of time to play games, but, like, I did play Starbound for the first time from Chucklefish. And, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really that familiar with Terraria or games like that, but um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, uh, the, uh, they've made a lot of effort to build out that fictional universe. So they've, they've got, like, you can scan the environment and you get flavor text for everything that's going on, and they've worked really hard on building a, a mythology for that, mm. that that kind of like mining and building game and uh, it looks really cool and I, I think I'm probably going to buy it after the show it looks uh, it's really good fun it's a lovely little game yeah Starman actually they're, they're told, what they're showing here specifically is the, the beginnings of what will be their narrative side of the game right yeah yeah like you uh, you, you kind of uh, uh, basically it seems like your, your, your race or like the government gets wiped out and then you hook up this uh, matter kind of creation tool and then go off on a ship by yourself and it, se it seemed really cool I uh, and yeah I think it is the first time they've shown it here and so like when I died it crashed but like <laughs> obviously it's an early version so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not out there yet but no I thought it was really really cool and then I um, I played uh, Worms I think it's RMD at the uh, WMD That's, WMD yeah. RMD is not a thing WMD <laughs> I'm thinking thing. I'm thinking R -M -D, R -M -D. Which is uh, yeah yeah so research research of mass destruction so that was good uh, yeah <laughs> Uh, WMD, which um, adds vehicles to Worms for the first time. Oh, so you've got like uh, military helicopters and like tanks. You can just jump in and like use them to uh, to shoot other uh, other worms. And like that was um, that was quite a cool addition. It's like I was like, oh, well, I wonder why they didn't add that years ago, you know. Mm. Um, but that was really enjoyable. They've added something to Worms like in a recent entry called Old Lady, which I wasn't aware of as a thing. Like it's uh, next in the line of like sheep and you know. I think, I think I was aware of Old yeah. Lady. The old Lady's been around a while. Yeah, old, old Lady. Been around, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, yeah, and it, uh, just an old lady that distributes poison and uh, you know <laughs> she I've didn't got... used to do that she used to blow up yeah so, okay, she used yeah, to be yeah. like a slower version of the sheep as old ladies yeah. do this conversation means absolutely nothing <laughs> to somebody who hasn't played worms but i played worms and it was it was wonderful yeah and, uh yes and i had a bit a bit of uh, time with sheltered from team 17 as well which mm. is like uh i guess a little bit like fallout shelter where you're kind of like um, you're trying to survive in this underground bunker and uh you're trying to capture supplies you send out uh your family on like supply missions and stuff and had the biscuit family and uh, Dave Biscuit, I think, died of starvation, and that was good. The irony. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. And so today I'm going to go around and play Dark Souls, and uh, I'll give Total Warhammer a go, and yeah, it's going to be good. Awesome. It's nice to have Team 17 here, actually, because they're such a, they've been such a fixture of British games development. Obviously, this event's taking place in London. The, you know, it's sort of nice to have that presence here for what a team that's basically just 
continue to generate worms. <laughs> yes. At a high standard for a long time. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have them here, and they've got a really good, interesting spread of uh, different games as well. They brought their survival mode for The Walking Dead, the escapist Walking Dead as well, so mm. gave that a little bit of a go. Didn't know what I was doing, and uh, did quite badly, but it, it looked really cool. It was, uh, it was yeah. <laughs> Put that in the box. Put that in the box. Tom, what did you get up to yesterday? Um, apparently, if you beat the Total War Warhammer uh, demo on hard, you get a T-shirt. So I was, I went for the T-shirt. Did you um, get the T-shirt? No, no. <laughs> they, um, the orcs made a giant moon on the battlefield, and then it, the moon went over my cannons, and they got sucked up into the moon and died. <laughs> It was a man uh, in it's good. chair. <laughs> I enjoyed it. it was a, a moon <laughs> ate your cannon. <laughs> moon ate my cannon. So you don't get a t-shirt. There was a giant, there was a giant spider as well, which I attacked with flying helicopters. Um, they as died. Supposed to ground helicopters. Yeah, they. It was, it was, a, it was a massacre. It was a horrible, horrible massacre that I greatly enjoyed actually. It was, um, it was playing really well. <laughs> but you, you've played a lot of Total War, right? Like and you, I, I'm familiar with Warhammer, and I've played. Are you familiar with Warhammer? So yeah. it's, it, I, in the Venn diagram of stuff, I'm the target the target audience for it and uh, which meant that I'm always guaranteed to like it and it, it was really fun it looks it looks amazing as yeah. well like um, it's, I, I'd say as far if you if you're not really been into uh, Total War games before like just seeing that in action I think will will make you interested in it just this large-scale fantasy you know uh, strategy which you don't really haven't really seen like that since Warcraft 3 probably yeah um, so yeah it's, uh, it's it feels fresh in a weird kind of way did yeah. the did the magic stuff like catch you off guard at all as a Total War player because like a moon killed my cannons is not something that would happen in Shogun. Yeah, it doesn't really happen. The, the closest comparison in the Total War series would be um, off map artillery stuff, in which was in the expansion Fall of the Samurai, I think. Yeah. Where not could, Rise of the Samurai, which not, is a small like, I got idea. Them they came up the and then they went back down again. Uh, and so in in that game, you could park boats uh, near a battlefield and then you the battlefield. And it's kind of feels closer to that, but obviously it's, it's much more mad because it's just it's pink goo flying everywhere and moons and, and people just catch fire. Uh, so it's quite it's quite confusing, but also quite fun. Mm. I think. Awesome. We'll be talking to those guys after this actually to try and find out a little bit more about how they built that yeah. rebuilt Total War within a fantasy world, which is kind of still yeah, it's cool. kind of interesting. It's a challenge. It really uh, it works for the giant stuff because what best thing about Warhammer is the giant monsters and uh, the impact they can have on the battlefield. And in that engine, giant monsters just work really well. So the giant spider creature that the orcs and goblins have looks amazing. It's really fierce. And I We've kind got of, one here. Yeah, there's one actually over there, and, um, <laughs> which is invisible to Chris. Chris can't see it. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, it's it works really well. So hopefully, are they doing a live demo uh, next? Uh, we'll, we'll show some footage of the game. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah, it's cool. Did you, did you guys see the Vive at all so far? No, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to get on it before the end of the day. There's um, been an enormous amount of demand. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think, yeah. We, I think we'll, we'll get on it by the, before the end of the day for sure. But like um, every time I walk past it, someone's having a life changing experience. Yeah. So, whoa! <laughs> yeah. The way they've Holy set up those booths with the kind of like waist high thing that makes it look a little bit like a stable. Yes, yeah. Like, uh, sort of, yeah, VR stable where members of the public are having a life changing experience meeting a whale in virtual reality or something, but you just walk past and it's just a man with some paddles in the dark. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. The, the good thing is they've got the screen running, uh, a monitor running by the side so you can see what they're seeing. But it is more fun to not look at that and just watch them being daft. Um, yeah. So that's good. I wonder uh, how yeah. much of an obstacle that will be to the acceptance of VR. The, even though, particularly with the Vive, the experience is amazing. And everyone walks away from that experience, suddenly evangelical about VR, figuring out how they can put aside the 700, 800 pounds plus the pipes of the high spec DC they need to make it something they can have at home. You do look like a prat. Yeah. And I wonder how much, I mean, not that. There's a lot of parts of gaming that you don't exactly look amazing doing. But yeah, I think it's all right. Like, you know, uh, I, I don't look that cool when I'm using a joystick in my desk, you know. <laughs> I'll be honest, you yeah. know. Let's not, be fair. It is not the sexiest thing in the world. Playing Metal Gear in your pants is not like the highlight of your sartorial calendar, is it? No, no, I, I suppose not. Um, no, I think, I think that'll be fine. Like, uh, yeah, I, I, I really can't wait to, to try it. Like, I think it's going to be... Uh, I think you, it just, it's just going to be a moment that the people here will remember forever the first time they saw that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm kind of glad. Like, obviously, it's, it's nice to get as many people through that as possible. And certainly for this show, it's one of those things where it's like the demand for VR is so crazy. And yet, it is the hardest thing to demo to people and the hardest thing to explain to people as well. It's such a weird piece of technology that yeah. you don't understand it until you've used it. 
can't use it because it's one of the highest barriers to entry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet, people who do come away from this like as just like missionaries for VR, kind of spreading out into the world, saying, "I touched an egg and it was real." Yeah, it could be a thing as well where people try it and like maybe they don't uh, buy it straight away, but in a couple of years' time, when like I don't know, maybe the uh, standard PC tech overtakes VR a little bit, uh, or like the VR headset will no doubt be multiple iterations of it. Um, yeah, it's just something for the future. But to try it here first, it will. Uh, yeah. They'll just they won't forget it for sure. Awesome. So beyond attempting to get your way into the VR stable, what else are you going to do with? Because this is our final day. This event wrap up in end of the afternoon. Yeah. What are you? What do you want to try and see before that happens? I'm going to go see Stellaris in action from Paradox. Yeah. Uh, who we've got on one of our stages uh, downstairs, and like one of the, the their presentation will be on PCGamer.com next week, which would be great. Um, I'd love to love to see what they've got to offer because that yeah. drew a massive crowd yesterday, and uh, yeah, that's exciting to me. They're being they're being pretty um, pretty cautious with how they they introduce that game to people. They're doing a lot of like sort of stuff just for the crowd here. Uh, I know there was a lot of demand for them on the live stream actually. We did invite them to be on live stream, but they they're kind of really keen to just show off in a kind of closed environment at the moment. I think until they've got it perfect, yeah. but it is looking really exciting. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Such a great, so great to have uh, you know, a game like that here. It's just you know. Uh, sort of like quietly anticipated by a really hardcore fan base, and we've certainly had some of them here, which is really cool. Ooh. Tom, what are you? Um, I'm going to go see Master of, Master of Orion, which is the other 4X space strategy game yeah. at the show. Um, that'll be quite interesting uh, to see how they actually. Because uh, mm. uh, Master of Orion is, of course, like a, a reboot, a resurrection of a classic, um, and then Stellaris is trying to shake up that formula. And it'll be yeah. interesting to kind of see which is actually more interesting. Mm. Uh, whether the nostalgic kind of one is, is somehow better than the You're doing a phenomenal one. job of allowing me to throw to the schedule, by the way. Because <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll have Master of Orion here at half past three this afternoon, yeah, GMT. Awesome. No, it's cool. Um, oh, there's room for both, right, as well? Like, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. No, it's exciting. I'll try that out, too. It's going to yeah. be good. I think one of the things that struck me, actually, uh, when I did get a chance to walk around the show floor yesterday and see this stuff is, like, it's fair to say we've got, like, a lot of mid-sized publishers here, like, and that's the sort of... Um, the companies that have come to define PC gaming, I think, are tend to be like mid-sized studios, right? Like, yeah, not so much like the EAs and Ubisofts of the world, but Paradox, War Gaming, Sega's PC division, companies like Relic and Creative Assembly, yeah, yeah, and as well as a load of indies. And it's really nice seeing how diverse an offering PC gaming has come to mean. That's like, yeah, it's that's really been a, kind of cool. Yeah, there's like boots like Prison Architect, Super Hot, like it's really just a, a massive spread of stuff here. It's yeah, really you cool. can wander from Super Hot to Street Fighter to Prison Architect mm. via literally uh, Town of Light. Room, yeah, yeah, literally the same room via Town of Light. And then I have to play Worms for a little bit. And then you can go over here and you know play Terror Tech, which is a you know racing game and then Dark Souls while also then Regency's not Regency Salt Air Shadow Hand. Like it's yeah, it's kind of that's how diverse PC gaming has become. One of the great things I, uh, I've seen here is like um, Sega has been giving away free Steam keys for anyone who plays a Sega game at their booth. So like um, I got Crazy Taxi, which is cool. <laughs> but we were chatting to a guy yesterday who got Valkyria Chronicles for free. Yeah. So like that's uh, that's really really cool. So people just come away with it having uh, having cool stuff. Which yeah. Is there's a. I was uh, talking to the Relic people earlier, and they told me a funny story about because at the Sega booth, yeah, if you play any of their games, they'll give you a scratch card. You have a chance to have a Steam key for any of the games in the Sega catalog. And of the hundreds and however many they've got with them, three of those, three of those scratch cards are like a golden ticket, which gives you every single Sega game on Steam Amazing. going back forever. And one guy won that while on the like penultimate round of like Last Stand in Dawn of War Two, oh, wow. and he was so stressed out about how close he was to get into Wave Twenty and finishing that last stand game of Dawn of War 2 that he wasn't very excited at all about his prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which is like that for me is like if, if yesterday's thing was four dudes standing around American Truck Simulator that's today's oh PC gaming yeah, yeah, sort of thing sure. like I don't care that I've just won this huge Steam library I've really got to kill some orcs. <laughs> yeah yeah that's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Alright well we are going to be back in about 15 minutes with Simon from Creative Assembly to talk about Total War Warhammer Stay tuned, schedule, as I said, it's right down there in the stream description with timings for exactly when to tune in for the games that you're most interested in. And I'm really sorry that we can't magically accelerate when Bannerlord is going to be here, <laughs> but it will still be here at four o'clock. Four o'clock. Thanks. See you in a bit. <laughs>
Hello again, YouTube. We're back, and I'm here with Simon from Creative Assembly, who's a battle designer, that's right, on Total War Warhammer. I'm also getting that right as well. That yes. is the correct, the correct arrangement of the word war. Total War Warhammer, yes. Total War Warhammer, me. great. Awesome. So, talk me through a little bit about A, the game, and B, your specific role in kind of shaping it so far, because you guys are getting closer and closer to release, right? Yeah, I mean, like, we are really, really close now, right? But basically, Total War Warhammer is us attempting to kind of bring to life the fancy tabletop game which has kind of affected generations of people. I mean, it's been around for years and years, and in my opinion, like, nobody's really done a good job of kind of bringing it into, like, kind yeah. of the world of video game. You had some wicked games in the past, but... Like Shadow of the Horned Rat. Shadow of the Horned Rat, Shadow of the Rat was amazing, Dark Omen was great, and mm. we really want to kind of follow on with that and make something that's truly a really kind of culmination of the Warhammer series and the franchise. So you're going to be sitting there. It's still a total war game at the heart, right? So you've still got the kind of turn-based campaign map where you're managing regions, moving armies, constructing buildings, conquering provinces, but then you've also got a kind of excellent battle system which really feeds more into the kind of Warhammer style of it. Mm. So, you know, you've got these armies marching across tables, <laughs> as yeah, it were, right. kind of towards each other and fighting. You'll be seeing, you know, units from the Warhammer tabletop game. So if you love Warhammer already, you'll see lots of recognizable things that we brought in. But also, if you're not a fan of Warhammer and perhaps like strategy games or fantasy games, like they're really planning to kind of try and bring you into this world and right. kind of make you start to love it as well. Has like so? I think a lot of the question here, particularly if you come at this from a total war angle, mm. is what has it taken to get fantasy into that, as interesting in principle and in pra and practically, and sort of I guess what does that offer you as a game designer? Because you've worked on the Total War series extensively already, correct? Like, uh, yeah, I was yeah. on a tiller, yeah. Right, so for sure. So like, what what difference does it make that you have? magic, that you have orcs, that you have, you know, the fantastic creatures and so on. I mean, I think we said as marketing, our rules have changed. You know? <laughs> the rules have changed. <laughs> I know, I know. But like, it kind of has, to no. a certain extent. I mean, like, traditionally, we have a very standard style of kind of military medieval combat. So you've got kind of infantry, cavalry, mm. artillery, archers, etc., etc. But in order to bring a fantasy game to life, you don't have just those kind of fairly standard historical unit archetypes. You've got flyers, right? You've got dragons that are flying across the battlefield. You've got undead and zombies, you know, they fall into similar realms, but you're having to do it in a slightly different way. So, you know, you've got to really bring new sets of mechanics to manage it, as well as kind of magic as well. Like, mm. you know, traditionally we've had a ability systems and things like that where you're able to kind of help your army forwards, but this is taking it to a whole other level. I mean, you're casting direct damage destructive spells on the enemy army. So, you know, it's been a real challenge for us to a balance that, right? Yeah. Because you don't want it so the whole battle is just the spells and these new units kind of water down too much the formula that we already have. So we kind of be trying really hard to kind of fit it in with our existing formula while bringing some new kind of ingredients to the recipe that is your combat experience. Presumably, on the other hand, you don't want that stuff to be too subtle either. I mean, I'm not saying that just, you know, uh, Tom, our, our web editor was on earlier having played the demo and lost all of his uh, like dwarven helicopters to the moon, apparently. So that's, you know, oh no, it was his cans, but nonetheless, so that's obviously a surprise. But I think when I was imagining you making this game, I was thinking there's a chance that some of those fantastic creatures will become sort of like elephants with hats on. You know what I mean? If we were transplanting from a, from a Rome game, how have you kind of what strategic element have you made that makes sure that this stuff, like your giant spiders, aren't simply an equivalent to an earlier unit with a fantasy skin, right? Yeah, I mean, like one of the biggest changes, and it is quite a subtle one, is that they are on their own, right? Previously, right. a yeah, unit sure. is always kind of multiple entities, and there were challenges, of course, with bringing that to life. But actually, a single entity unit, we've been able to really. A, you bring out the character, like the art and the animation we've used in the game is absolutely astounding. Mm. It's really, really good. But also we've been able to kind of look at this guy and say, what is a giant? We can start doing things like he has extremely high damage output. And we brought in things like AOE attacks and stuff to actually enable him mm. to deal the kind of damage that you would expect a giant to deal. But also his size becomes a factor that you can utilize in gameplay, right? He's really tall. If you're firing arrows at him, he's a pretty big target. He's quite right. easy to hit. So we've kind of been able to fit him into the kind of like kind of the fact part of the game, the kind of actual makeup of it, in a really nice way, while bringing a slightly new gameplay element to it, because mm. you want to use him to break a line, right? You want to charge him into a unit of infantry and totally break them, using his big attacks, his kind of knockaways, picking people up, smacking them on the ground. Mm. Like, break that single unit, but then you want to make sure he doesn't then get mobbed and yeah. kind of swamped down, because that's where he loses his edge, as it were. He can just mm. get surrounded and taken down from that point. How much, um, obviously you've got to introduce these Warhammer universe units, um, not just visually, but also mechanically, which we were discussing, but how much do you then have to kind of reflect how they work mechanically in the Warhammer game? You know, to what extent will a Warhammer player coming to Total War Warhammer 
be able to go, actually, I kind of know what this is for. I've played the tabletop game for 15 years, that kind of thing. Mm. I mean, I think they're very much trying to take the spirit of the game. Right. So like, I don't think we can really one-to-one -one map all of our kind of systems and things like that and bring them kind of to one-to-one -one parity. It's a turn-based versus a real-time game. So, you know, there are going to be things that we can't strictly do that way. But we've taken the kind of the theme and the feeling of what Warhammer is and used that to kind of approach our balancing as well right. as I was saying with like the giant for example like we kind of see what, what is a giant in the tabletop game what what is his purpose how does he fit into an army and how do we bring that to life in total war but importantly kind of we're not just targeting Warhammer players with this we really want to make it accessible to all mm. as it were like we really want everyone to be able to pick this up play it and really enjoy it so we kind of really want to introduce you to things slowly but surely so we're unlocking the units kind of over time as it were so as you play through a campaign you're kind of getting them in dips and drabs, so you're actually getting used to a unit before we approach you with others. We're doing long kind of introductory gameplay on the campaign where mm. you sort of get taught all these things and get really brought into the, A, the work, right? because yeah. there's a lot to see there, but also into the units and the mechanics that your faction's gonna have, because every faction plays really, really differently from one another. So this is not just, I mean, I suppose that's interesting what I was gonna say, because this is not just fantasy, it's fiction, and that's mm. very different to every other Total War game. Even, you know, this is not, attempting to recreate history. You have a liberty not just to create sort of these sort of fantastic units, but to tell a story, which you wouldn't necessarily have had within history, right? There are well you can do certain things with historical battles and so on, but broadly speaking, mm. a sort of a, a character driven narrative is much harder if it's you're talking about ancient Rome or feudal Japan. Yeah. Like how has that kind of influenced the way this game sort of works, both from a player perspective and as you coming at it as a developer? I mean like my personal favourite thing about Total War is actually you make your own story. Right. So you've got your kind of overarching narrative that's mm. kind of going on. It's kind of my faction that I'm playing as, what happens to me, how I play, but then also the characters within your faction. Mm. So you know they gain traits and abilities and things. They kind of all become their own little characters as it were, which I really, really like. But in Warhammer, as you say, we've kind of got this really interesting lore and actual narrative that we can we can pluck from, right? So we kind of very early on, we decided we were going to look at a single part of that narrative. Like we're going to look at a single kind of era, as it were. So we don't really have a concept of years or time moving forward in that, which really lets us explore this kind of panorama, as it were, of what is actually going on in the world at the time. But also we have very much a sandbox game, right? So we do still want players to make their own stories. So the way we've generally approached that is we've kind of put lots and lots of lore and narrative and stuff into the world, but it's all player accessed. It's not something that we literally throw into your face unless we really feel it's strongly kind of advancing the narrative or it's an important date or something like that. But we actually let you experience it at your own place, which is the quest battles, which is right. kind of one of my favorite features. So, you know, when you reach certain ranks on the campaign map, you unlock a quest. Mm. And at the end of the quest, you get a character's magic item, which you've taken from the rule books themselves. But these quests are kind of every mission on that quest gives you a bit more lore and a bit more narrative about that character themselves, as well as the kind of mindset of the faction and the race that you're actually playing with at that point. Something that really stood out to me when I was talking about to see the game earlier was, mm. and in most, this must affect you, the battle designer is the environments are very different. The, the places where the battles take place feel extremely different from any other Total War game I've seen. The people who are here at the show playing are playing in a, like a sort of dwarven underground hall which is an incredibly square environment, sort of like broken off with waterfalls and some sort of like fallen masonry and stuff. Does that change the way you go, ahead, you know, go about designing battlefields for Total War? You're not on rolling hillsides anymore necessarily, right? Mm. I mean, it's an interesting one because it almost started off more as a kind of art perspective. So we're doing right. the kind of Blackfire Pass map and we thought, you know what, this is a fantasy world. This isn't just kind of flat plains everywhere. There's going to be some really <laughs> almost over the top environments that you're looking at. So Blackfire Pass was really tall and there were entrances to like Dwarven Mines and things like that around. Like it was a really interesting environment because you kind of got locked in by it. You're almost in an arena at that point. And we thought this is actually quite cool. So we then started looking, what effects is this going to have on gameplay, right? Because you know, any change like that, you're affecting the way the game plays. So we started looking, we can actually change the, what we call the playable area, the area you actually fight your battle in based on that. So the level we have here, Thundering Falls, is in the Dwarven Underway, so it's kind of subterranean, it's the ancient Dwarven pathways between their settlements. But once again, we were kind of, when these have to be long and thin, these have to feel claustrophobic, right? You, don't, you can't have a big cave that's really open and wide. Yeah. So we went, let's make it claustrophobic. But then it also gave us some really interesting ideas. We've made lots of entry points and ingress areas onto that map, so reinforcements and things were able to come in and join the battle. And you know, when you're playing Thundering Fools, you'll see the enemies kind of are scripted to come on from the sides and things like that. So mm. it really made us kind of think, you know, what happens when we change this area size? Does it have to be a square playable area? Can we play with different 
mm. shapes and sizes. And the interesting thing it also brought is it kind of played into the dwarf faction quite heavily. I mean, they've got no cavalry, right? They're, right yeah. Every faction's so different. The dwarf's main thing they haven't got is any form of fast moving cavalry unit. They've got the gyrocopters, as you mentioned mm. earlier, but on the whole, they're very slow, you know, lots of artillery pieces, you know, they needed to kind of unlimber in order to fire, things like that. Like, so you kind of got to play with that. So they're very good at getting flanked, right? Mm. And the greenskins are very excellent at flanking because they've got mainly wolf riders and fast moving units. So actually we found out by shrinking these areas in the dwarf and underway. It, it suits it the dwarf. suited the dwarf gameplay really, really well. So mm. it's kind of, it worked nicely from a kind of thematic viewpoint as well as a gameplay. So I guess that's sort of partly the storytelling you're talking about, right? You can sort of explain <coughs> or imply why the dwarves are the way they are strategically using the fantasy environment that they yeah. created. And all the dwarf and mountain paths and stuff are their own environments. You'll see these amazing kind of mountain ranges and uh, dwarf and characters. Characters are like their entrances to their cities. They're kind mm. of more fortresses than anything. But, yeah. you know, and you'll see all these kind of amazing things when you're playing in those regions. But as you say, like, it will play into your hands as a dwarf and player. So you can really be very defensive and very turtling, which is what a dwarf really should be at that yeah. point. Turtling. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen a lot of the campaign map on the on the video, I think, and mm. so it'd be great to. I, mean, I know you're a battle designer first and foremost, but you've worked on campaign stuff before. Mm. As a, as developers, has this felt like you know a steady evolution? Because I guess my perspective as a player is that the Total War campaign map has evolved over time and through the games and across the eras. Is this a big evolution, big huge step in that, or is it a continual you know ev you know a, a continual development of what the process has been ongoing with Creative Assembly for a long time? Mm. I and mean, I think it's as much an evolution as it is a revolution. I mean, one of the main things we decided to do is we've got loads of really strong mechanics that certainly Total War players are familiar with, but also most strategy players can probably quite easily comprehend from that. So kind of, we really sat there and went, what have we got? So rather than trying to invent lots and lots of brand new mechanics, let's see what mechanics we already have and which ones we can evolve and make into something different. So for example, um, previous Total War games, we've had like missions, mm. for example, once again, this ties into the narrative a little bit. Yeah. You've got your missions, so they're kind of randomly pop up based on conditions in the world. And it's things like, you know, go attack this faction or collect 5,000 gold, something, and you get a reward for that. So we thought, how do we take that with like the dwarfs, for example? And we just released a campaign gameplay demo, which is on YouTube at the minute. It's quite interesting to see some of the mechanics they have as a faction, but we thought, the dwarves have this thing called the Book of Grudges, right? So anytime anyone does something that wrongs them, such as spills their beer or kind of shaves their beard or something like that, <laughs> they get yeah. quite angry and they write it down in blood in a book called the Damas Kron, the Book of Grudges. And basically the dwarves want to clear the Damas Kron. They want to have kind of repaid and avenged all the grudges mm. that they haven't. We went, let's turn that into a mechanic. Let's say you do have these missions to achieve. They're tied into how you win the game as the dwarves, but they're also something you've got to pay attention to. If you're not filling out the damn if you're not kind of writing the wrongs, as it were, you'll start getting penalties such as public order and things like that. Right. So we were able to take something that already exists to mm. a certain extent, but really remould it and bring it in something new. And you'll be seeing these kind of things with every faction, right? Like every race on the game has their own campaign as well as battle mechanics that really differentiate them from one another. Mm. So that, uh, to clarify that book of grudges, is that dynamic based on being wronged in the course of the campaign or is it something you guys have you know, it almost forms a kind of scripted set of it's, wrongs. Yeah. It's definitely when you've been wronged. Um, okay. So the Greenskins, I was recently playing, and the Greenskins came and took one of my uh, small settlements, right. some of my kind of little towns, as it were. Um, they came and take it. The yeah, Book of Grudges popped up, and I was like, oh, not another one. <laughs> I've got to take this one off as well. So my mission was then, I've got to take back that settlement from right. the Greenskins, right? I've got to go and destroy them. Unfortunately, it was Grimgore Ironhide with a very large army, so yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to work towards that one, I think. That's, yeah. <laughs> So you guys are you're zooming ever closer to the release of this game. Like, I guess, what's the, like, how, what kind of feedback have you managed to get so far? I mean, I imagine this, hopefully this, you know, you, I know you've, you've been more doing the stage stuff at this event. You mm. showed the game off to a lot of people yesterday. Like, what is the, the response you've gotten both from Warhammer fans and from people who've maybe come, come at this as the next Total War game? Yeah, I mean, response so far has been really good, actually. Yeah. Like, like people are saying, it's fun. It's a really fun game because we've brought so many new things to it like as we were saying earlier with the battle units and certainly people who've seen the campaign map and we've chatted to about that like seem really interested in all the new things we brought and the way in which they all fit in with what Warhammer is as a franchise like you know so much of it feels Warhammer and we've had Warhammer fans come up and go I'm buying this game yeah. I don't care yeah. you, you, you've taken one of my units that I've got painted at home and suddenly mm -hmm. it's running around a battlefield like people are loving that side of it but also people are really loving the gameplay concepts that are coming out of that and Kind of from a feedback point of view, it's been great to get feedback at events. You know, we started 
having gameplay quite early on, actually. We had people playing the game at a very early stage. We've got lots of internal things where we're playing the game internally and generating feedback and working through that because we are pretty much at the kind of polish balancing phase now, right. right? Like, this is the point where we're trying to kind of really tighten the screws and actually make it a kind of tight, fun experience for veterans and new players alike. So, it's actually, it's, it's notable at this event, almost coincidentally, that there's so much Warhammer here. <laughs> there's a lot of Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more hammer sort of dispersed into the gaming world, and, it, oh, and it's, it's having a, a big resurgence. You know, we, we spoke to the Eternal Crusade guys, mm. which is their Warhammer 40,000 multiplayer shooter yesterday. Uh, speaking to you now, we have Dawn of War, which admittedly is an older game, but is continuously being updated. They're coming on later today. Like, is it interesting occupying a space that's so many different developers of different, uh, different levels of, of the industry and, and so many different approaches to a license that you now have to share with them? What's that? What's it like kind of seeing all that stuff being done around the thing you're doing? For me personally, I think it's quite interesting. Yeah. Like, as I was saying earlier with games like Shadow the Horned Rat, and then you've had a, like a Vermintide and stuff coming out fairly recently, like, everyone's kind of telling a slightly different story, mm. right? Everyone's taken that core lore and been able to tell their story yeah. from it and make the game that's sort of letting players experience their story of it. And I find it quite interesting to see that side of it. Like, as you were saying, kind of Dawn of War and kind of the new third-person shooter, like, they're quite different games, they've got yeah. a really different feel in the kind of texture of them and the way that they actually play out. And I think it's quite fun to see everyone having a go at telling that story. Yeah, it? I mean, and also I guess you're working with a community in the Warhammer community who are enormously passionate about that specific thing. And I wonder if, I suppose, do you feel like you've not, I wonder if you wouldn't necessarily face the same scrutiny even mm -hmm. from people who really like history, right? People who really like history, but history is pretty much I don't know how many fans there are of ancient Rome who might feel if you don't get if you don't get the Gladius quite right, they'll they'll know. <laughs> like I mean, you, you're entering a new world of working with fandom here, mm. I guess. Does that sort of change your relationship with that community at all? Change where you think about how you're developing the game? Mm. I mean, like luckily in the studio, we have got a lot of people who are also really big Warhammer, Warhammer fans, yeah, right? Yeah, right? You know, Warhammer's a game we're going to be supporting for years and years now. Like you know, we've got expansions. You know, we're going to be developing more and more races, expanding our campaign map. You know, there's loads going to be going on with it. So, we've got loads of people in the studio who are massive, massive. Warhammer fans, right? So that's been a really good starting point for us, right? But also with regards to history, as you were saying, like history is kind of malleable to a certain extent. It's yeah. written by the victors, as it were. There's for lots sure. of kind of differentiating, account, differentiating accounts over kind of most parts of it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of subjectivity going around it. But with a law such as Warhammer, you do have to kind of be on, on point with it, on the ball with it. And we have really tried to kind of keep as close to the original literature as we really can, mm. because it's something that people love, right? Like, if somebody really loves something, you don't want to go in and start kind of messing around with it too much. We don't mess with their orcs. No, don't mess with thank, the orcs. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us and no for showing us the game. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show, and I believe you're, you're showing off the game again later this afternoon yep. downstairs. Are you going to be trying, I know you did this yesterday, getting the audience to direct the battle for you? Yes, it was really successful yesterday. You say that. Is that true? No. Okay. <laughs> um, the first order was to retreat. Okay. <laughs> um, and from that point on, it all went slightly downward spiral. As it would. <laughs> yeah. Were they deliberately attempting to undermine you, you think? No, I think it was an honest tactical <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um But we're going to try it again today because it was actually quite a bit of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks for, for joining me. We'll Thank be back in about 10 minutes with Charles Cecil. He'll be showing us some of the stuff that he's doing about the history of his own work in the games industry. And once again, Bannerlord is at 4 o'clock. We'll catch you later.
Hello again, YouTube. I'm back with Charles Cecil, hey. the man responsible for now decades of adventure games, right back to the beginning of adventure games on the PC specifically. And Charles, you're here at the event to talk about the history of adventure games, that's right. From, from my perspective, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although, um, Revolution celebrates, of course, its 25th anniversary, right. but I actually wrote my first adventure for the Sinclair ZX81 back in 1981, so that actually goes a further 10 years back, I'm afraid. Okay, thank God I said decades and not yeah, a specific exactly, number exactly, of years. Exactly, Yeah, okay. I just so. wanted to make it clear at this point so that, you know, we, we had a context. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, well, specifically talking about the history of Revolution and many games, including the entire Broken Sword series, Beneath the Seal Sky, and more, which you're now kind of, I, I guess, we've got it right here, we can point at it, repackaging up. Yeah, and Year of the Temptress was our very first one, right. written, um, published in 1992, a game called In Cold Blood, mm -hmm. which has got quite a cult following, actually. Um, wasn't enormously successful, um, and, and all the games are in our 25th anniversary box. So, because this is here, and it's, well, it's the box in the room, let's talk about, and I suppose this is, this is actually, I would just find out before we went live, this is the first time you've seen this yeah. in real life as well. Yeah. So we were going to crack it open and actually have a look about what you're packaging yeah, together. Yeah, it's really so. exciting. It's, it's actually quite chunky. Now, I remember, uh, and I'm sure you will, when, when PC boxes used to be really exciting because obviously yeah. you're excited by the game. It used to be enormous as well. And then you'd open them up and there were lots of cool things in there. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I'm on a sort of crusade to try and get back to those days where it's actually full of really, really cool things. Remember those <laughs> MicroPress boxes yeah, where, where you'd have ones. those fantastic manuals mm. or, or the ultimate where you'd have maps and stones and all those sorts of things. That's so, yeah, so no. great. Bringing back, bringing back the physical PC game, one box at a time. Absolutely. Let's have a look. Let's open it up because you've should, never actually should, opened it. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. This Presumably is this can. is indeed. I mean, obviously, I had a lot to do with the the design of of, of what's inside, but uh, I've never actually seen it. What a beautiful box. It's incidentally the first unboxing video I've ever done. So there Very you are snazzy. with the with, with without the cover. Very nice. Actually, I'm really pleased with that. Oh, and then it's very look nice. what's inside, a broken sword. Um, and actually, a, 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 a USB broken stick. sword. And the, and the USB stick actually takes the form of a broken sword, which is <laughs> really gratifyingly literal. Uh, comic books. Now, lovely quality. I'm very Who's, pleased uh, with that. Worked on the comic books. I know you've worked with a lot of comic creators. Well, in Dave, Dave Gibbons. Um, oh, wow. We worked with Dave Gibbons for Beneath the Steel Sky. That's he, right. he was, um, we, we were working partnership with him. And he produced uh, this comic book for Beneath the Steel Sky. Um, at the time, and then subsequently we've kind of kept in touch. In fact, I had lunch with him two days ago. Um, really, really quite a good friend, um, terrifically talented guy. Uh, and he produced a number of these comics as well, so the Broken Sword 1 um, and Broken Sword 2, and then his colleague uh, Angus Mackay uh, worked on Broken Sword 5. So between the two of them, they're responsible for pretty much all of this. So if you're not familiar with, with Dave Gibbons' work, he's probably most famous for Watchmen, I would say. Yeah, yeah. 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 His work with Alan Moore. Uh, uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, yep, yep, yep. If, just in case you weren't familiar with as a comic book artist, but I suppose if you're into comics, you definitely would have heard of him. That's a beautiful poster. Posters. For your bedroom. For all I came. Sorry, I'm really excited by this. <laughs> I haven't no, seen I'm any actually, of this stuff I'm going, before. I'm doing this vicariously through you because this is amazing. I've never seen somebody uh, unbox something they've never seen before of their own work. Broken Sword 2. Amazing. And then on top of that, you have the, 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 the archive here, or, which has got um, about two hours of um, footage, mm -hmm. which is basically talking to people like Dave, Dave Gibbons, talking Barrington Felong, and, and, and team members, just reminiscing about the history of creating these games. About the history and, 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 the and memories. Um, and, and that's this uh, DVD. And then this is a, a CD, uh, audio CD, which can be played just in a normal CD player. Um, and, and, and here we have our, our games from Broken Sword 5 on this side, which is massive, and, and, the rest and, of and all of the rest of them on, on a different <laughs> that's uh, DVD. Off, that's, that's probably the best visual sign of how things have changed it, technologically. It <laughs> Every other game you've made for Revolution on one CD, yep. Broken Sword 5 on its own. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's great. So what I'm really excited to see that, thank you for giving me the opportunity no, no, to, uh, to, 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 to go over that. That's awesome. What, what did it take to put this documentary together? I'm kind of interested to see, because this must have been a... Uh, I was talking to Stefano earlier. You led that, right? That, that attempt to bring together the history of the. Well, in, in many ways, but we, we have the most wonderful community. Right. Um, when we uh, launched the Kickstarter campaign for Broken Sword 5, suddenly all of these people kind of approached us and were very warm about that. And, and they're the ones that pointed out that you know, Broken Sword is coming out for its 20th anniversary. We're coming out for. They're, they're really excited on our behalf, which is just brilliant. It's, mm. it's really, really gratifying. 
And you know, part of what uh, I, I like to talk about is the relationship that we have with that community. Mm. And you kind of hear these horror stories about communities that you know misogynistic and get you know and, and very aggressive with each other. Ours are just the nicest people ever, and it's just a real pleasure to. It's, it's a huge privilege to have them excited by what the games that we've written. Mm. Well, I mean, we were talking about this shortly before we went live, but the adventure game, which has had its sort of, it certainly had its ups and downs. Uh, financially or in terms of how many adventure games get made and so on. I'd say it's a huge resurgence recently in lots of different forms. But it's always been a very progressive part of the games industry, both in terms of storytelling as a, as a craft, but also in terms of the types of stories that get told and the sort of diversity of characters and tones and stuff. Was that apparent to you way back, even before Revolution, that that was the sort of... Yeah, well, what we were saying was that your colleague Richard Cobbett actually mm. has written some really interesting articles that, and he's a huge um, adventure Absolutely. fan. Uh, and, and he talks about, you know, back in the day in the late 80s and the early 90s, that really adventures drove the technological technological advances uh, graphically um, and, and clearly in terms of storytelling. And what kind of an interesting, what, 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 what then happened is that with the success of PlayStation, mm. um, retail Retailers stopped uh, stocking PC games, which of course, you know, adventures worked particularly well on, on, on PC in, in, in those days and still now. And the, the publishers talked about, you know, the death of the PC. They said the PC is dead as a format mm. because it's all about console. And without uh, retailers actually stocking uh, adventures, adventures clearly started to diminish in terms of mm. their, 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 their distribution. And um, what's really brought it back, um, because adventures are a niche, uh, mm. undoubtedly. You know, they're not mainstream in the way that first-person shooters would be. What's brought them back is digital distribution and the ability to distribute our games directly through, well, originally um, through Apple and, and iTunes and, and the App Store, and then, of course, the emergence of, of Steam and, and GOG and portals like that. And, and that's kind of rolled over now. And We had the huge privilege of being able to write the game on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Mm. So the whole thing really has gone full circle. Well, you're saying that you talk about a digital media, so digital distribution, Kickstarter is ultimately what has allowed a physical boxed game to kind of return to being, absolutely. which is kind of like absolutely. a nice gratifying and, circle. And, and a lot of a lot of developers are, are very negative about publishers. Now, you know, we have our own horror stories to tell, mm. but we also worked with some wonderful um, publishers. Uh, this, the reason that we're able to bring this uh, physically, is because of the relationship that we have with uh, Koch, uh, a German. Mm. Um, publisher and distribution company uh, and, and, and through their expertise uh, um, and through their distribution they've manufactured this they're going to distribute it and, and it's great to be able to you know if, if we'd said 10 years ago as, as, as digital was beginning to grow you know we'd still be producing boxes I don't think anybody would have believed us but 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 here it is can you talk to you a bit about your experience of Kickstarter because that's a much more recent Phenomena, right? Yes. And as much it, it has across multiple genres and multiple sides of the industry allowed things that people loved from a previous era in the industry's life, whether you're talking about traditional computer RPGs in the Ultima or Baldur's Gate vein or old school shooters and adventure games to kind of find the funding they needed. What was your experience of going to that as a developer? Well, we, we were there quite early. We uh, launched it in 2012. Mm. And so there wasn't very much to, to judge it against, apart from the phenomenal success that Tim Schafer had had course, yeah. with, with Broken Age. And what happened is that we galvanized, uh, ultimately we had 15,000 backers. We galvanized this group of people who were so extraordinarily passionate. They didn't talk about you know, Revolution's project, they talked about our project. Mm. And indeed it was their project because you know, they were funding it, they were partially funding it, and, and the enthusiasm that we had. And the idea of not working with your community absolutely terrifies me now because they gave us really, really valuable feedback. One of the, you know, when we launched the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter was at a very early stage, so the graphics were quite crude. But, you know, some of the feedback that we got was, you know, George, uh, our hero's um, jaw was slightly wrong. And people were absolutely right. Yeah. So we changed it. And, and it was like a, a virtuous circle because we went back and said, guys, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. But to them, they were thrilled that we were actually listening to them. Mm. So very quickly, this relationship developed where we really valued their feedback. And they, for the first time, were excited that actually somebody was listening to what they had to say. I was, I was going to, well, I was going to say, does Kickstarter not put pressure on you in a way you would necessarily experience otherwise, given your, your players, your customers, are also your investors and so on? But it sounds like it actually worked. That pressure was welcome in some way? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the Kickstarter 
raised a, a good proportion of the budget at the early stages, which is at the riskiest point. Mm. We then needed to go on and borrow money. We, we'd invested quite a lot of our own money, and we borrowed some from the bank and mm. various other things. So, so, but, but it was a, a really crucial part. So two things. One, the money at that point was absolutely essential. Um, because it was at the riskiest point. But two, it also, by having 15,000 people choosing to, 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 to pledge money, it meant that we knew that there was gonna ultimately be a demand. Mm. And you know, historically, a publisher would make that decision. And so often, as developers, we'd feel that they didn't have the expertise or the knowledge or they weren't close enough to the audience. Mm. Now we can get absolutely close to the audience. We can see what people want and they'll give us feedback and they'll be very honest about that. Mm. I'd be interested in talking about it. I think this box set particularly will be appealing to people who, presumably, some of whom will already know all of these games extremely well because that's why they're buying. They're picking up their fans and it's a, it has a collector's value. Do you anticipate introducing a new audience to these games using a package like this? Well, I, I certainly hope so because we our audience is basically split, I think, into two. And, and I don't know what the proportion is, but it's probably 50-50 between people who played it first time around mm -hmm. and people who are new. And a lot of those people came in through, um, through mobile. Um, and, and we'll have PCs and then go on of to course. play the PC game. And so they're two different audiences. They don't conflict with each other. Uh, when we launched the Kickstarter, a lot of our original fans said, oh, you're going to dumb it down. And we, we promised that we wouldn't dumb it down. And I, I hope people would accept that we haven't. We put a hint system in so that if people, you know, if people get stuck, then they can, they can move forward. Because when we first wrote uh, our adventure games, people loved the fact that they were being frustrated. That was part of the mm. charm. Now, uh, a contemporary audience really doesn't want to be frustrated. They want to kind of move forward. Um, so we've tried to balance that, but without dumbing it down, dumbing the, the, the puzzles down in any way. You're also releasing an adventure game into a world that has changed substantially in terms of how people share information, receive tips, and so on. If you were playing um, Broken Sword originally and you were stuck, you probably needed a magazine so to speak, <laughs> to help you out, or you know, a friend or someone like that. It was harder to find the advice you needed. Now, everything is a Google well, Absolutely, and, like, and a great example of that is uh, a puzzle that I designed for the first Broken Sword involving a goat in Ireland. I've heard Richard Cobbett talk about that, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm quite proud on one hand and slightly ashamed on the other that it mm. appears in you know, the top, the hardest video game puzzles ever. Mm. Um, but. The, 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 the stupidity, my stupidity in designing this. Having said that, it was celebrated in our Kickstarter. A bunch of uh, our backers came up with something called the Order of the Goat, which in, in, in celebration of this puzzle, <laughs> and, uh, and it kind of took on its own. And now there are lots of goat videos and things going around. And, and indeed, we produced a goat uh, USB for, for our backers. But what, 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 what's a, a, the audience in those, in those days was kind of split between people who really wanted difficult puzzles mm. and got really upset if, if they thought the puzzles were too easy and the rest of the world that kind of were normal people. Mm. And so I, I tried to uh, aim the, the game, the difficulty of the puzzles at the normal people level, but put in a really difficult puzzle to stop the, you know, the, the experts in, in, in the their, first game. For, 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 for the goat puzzle. This is what the goat puzzle was. And uh, of course, the stupid thing was that for the people who were absolute aficionados and understood the grammar perfectly well, it stopped them in their tracks for an hour or so. But for people who weren't, you know, the, the wider, they had absolutely not the first clue what to do. Mm. And as you say, you know, now you can go onto the internet, you can do a Let's Play, you could, you could look it up. But in those days, you really had to wait for the, the magazine. And, and a lot of people were stuck until the magazines came out and then they gave the solution away and only then could they move forward. I think more broadly, as, as you see more adventure games recently, there's more, there tends to be more acceptance of the idea that games don't necessarily need to be very challenging in order to be games and to be to tell stories and so on. Has that have you been influenced at all by some of the ways that other adventure games have sort of branched and changed as, as the kind of the mediums evolved? Well, that's 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 really interesting because um, one of uh, again to talk about Richard, what he talks about is the fact that. Adventures are kind of split into those that are looking back. So Ron Gilbert's Thimbleweed Park clearly is looking back and, and, and celebrating adventures from you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and then there's a whole lot of adventures that are looking forward. And I would hope that we were a part of that. Mm. And so you look at you know, her story, which mm. is really I mean, clearly an adventure told in a totally different way. Sure. Life is strange. Um, there's a whole raft of adventures which are really innovative and telling interesting stories in a totally different way. And that's certainly where we would like to see ourselves, rather than looking backwards. Well, give, well given that, and given that you're sort of now you've, you've marked this 25th anniversary in this way, sort of, what is next? Like, what 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 happens after that? 
this, 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 this moment of looking back. Do you know, the, the really great thing is that Revolution is, um, is very much a, a, a project studio. So we, mm. we, we, we expand when we go into projects and then we close back down again. So the Hollywood system is what other people call it. I think that's a bit pretentious <laughs> myself. But, but you know, the Hollywood system is people come together. So we're kind of in, um, in, in, in stasis at the moment, coming up with uh, a number of um, prototypes. We, we're not under huge pressure. We're not under huge pressure commercially. We're not rich. We would need to definitely some, find some sort of funding for our next game. But ultimately, we, we're not, because there's not a huge overhead, because we don't need to sell it to a publisher in the way that we would have done previously, we can go down multiple routes. And of course, in the background, that there is the potential of a new Broken Sword game, and that would be great. We're talking to Dave Gibbons about working with him in some capacity, mm. whether that be Beneath the Seal Sky or two, would, is, you know, yet to be decided. And then we've got a totally original game. There are two things that we want to do. We want to tell stories in an innovative way, mm. and we also want to be graphically advanced. Those are, those are kind of what we think our trademarks are, mm. and those are the things that, as we go forward, we want to absolutely stick with. I'm interested to, to pick your brain a bit about what graphically advanced means in that context because I think if you I think in the PC now specifically that is a that is a concept with a lot of different interpretations it is absolutely and and you look at you know Witcher 3 mm. and it looks absolutely brilliant on one hand in, 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 in the sense that they want to make it real. On the other, you've got Batman Arkham Knight, which just looks fantastic in a sort of comic book stylized way. Mm. Um, those are $100 million games. Absolutely. So we, we, we can't afford, nor do we want to write yeah. a $100 million game. So, so when I'm talking about advanced, you, you know, you, you, you look at um, a game like Monument Valley. I'm not saying it's like Monument Valley, but Monument Valley is absolutely beautiful in the way that they convey you know, I know that's a handheld rather than a... Uh, no, for sure, but, you know, but, yeah, but, right. or, or, or indeed Prune, which is a, a, you know, an iOS game. There are these games that are from small developers that look absolutely stunning, mm. but don't try and compete with 100 million. We are definitely down at the, at the, at the indie level rather than the $100 million um, level. But, but so, so, so I guess it, it's how it's interpreted. It's, it's, you know it when you see it. Yeah. Well, it seems like the... The, the way the whole sort of hobby of PC games works at the moment, people are far more accepting of craft at different levels and of different yep. types, and it's not necessarily a, a, a technological arms race in the way that it no, used to be. No, no. And when when you know for, when most of these games were written, everything went through retail. So, so 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 retail demanded however many games a year so they could fill their two or three or four hundred you know, slots, and, and that drove everything. So, you know, THQ, um, the publisher that published Broken Swords 3 and 4, absolutely thrived in that. The move to digital destroyed that mid-tier, mm -hmm. and THQ were bankrupt within three years, yeah. which was extraordinary. And, and now you have, you know, a huge, thriving indie community at one end. You have the $100 million, the GTAs, the games we just talked about, Metal Gear Solids, mm -hmm. at, at the other. And, and so I would like to think that from a, from, a, from a gamer's perspective, they've had more choice than ever, yeah. and there isn't that sort of mediocre stuff in the middle. It's either really interesting indie stuff or extraordinary production value mm. at the high end with a very, very wide range of choice. And, and because that's then embraced by gamers, that, as developers, that gives us huge opportunities as well. Mm. Um, ultimately, all we can do is write games that appeal to a broad audience. Um, and, and as an independent developer, we're always going to be doing it at the indie level rather than the, 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 the ultra high end. You touched earlier on, you know, the, the, with the rise of the console and that itself plays into the old story that's told again and again about the, the decline of the PC and then the rise of the PC again. And the same sort of stories have been told about the adventure game as a genre. We have a lot of narratives in this business about things that are either going away or coming back again almost constantly. Based on what you've just said, it sounds like actually things are a little bit more stable now in terms of what you can make and how you can make it, and yeah. maybe it's been true. But, but that's because previously the, 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 the way that games were written was absolutely around the publisher funds it, mm. the distributor produces it and sends it into retail, and retailer stocks it, and retailer has limited slots. Everything was based around that. So going to digital distribution destroys, absolutely destroys, um, this, this monopoly that retailers had. That, basically drove the way that games were developed. Mm. So that's, that is kind of from a, from, and, and, and then also the fact that, you know, um, because of that, a lot of publishers would have thought that there wasn't an indie scene, because there wasn't an indie, there couldn't be an indie scene, because if, 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 if retailers didn't stock it, there was no way of people actually getting to reach your audience. So that's, I, I think it's, in, in, in many ways, it's, it's because of the, because of those profound changes mm. that the whole space has changed. So in a sense, then this, this box set feels like it sort of rounds up a whole 
era in not just revolution in the games you created, but a whole bunch of different ways the games have been made from a very, very nuts and bolts kind of fashion. With that in mind, and time in mind, when, um, I appreciate you've seen this for the first time today, when can other people see it for the first time? Right, it goes on sale on the 16th of March. That's so end in, of next week? Yeah, 10 days time. Oh, wow. So that's really exciting. Um, and, and I hope that people, um, when they get to see it, that they're excited. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to see it for the first time. <laughs> it's great you know, to see you see it for the first time. Um, lots of posters, lots of you know, audios, soundtracks. The, the, a lot the, of games. A lot of games and, and the two hours of, of footage. I mean, that took a long, long time. I mean, one of the joys was actually driving around with the filmmaker, uh, Chris Brook. Um, and, and actually, we went to see Degadens, we went to see Barrington Felong, and I hadn't seen some of them for, for a couple of years. So it was a great opportunity to talk about, well, to talk about the past, but also to talk about the future. Mm. Charles, thank you very much well, thank for joining you. us it's on the live stream. Huge pleasure speaking to you. Great. Best of luck with your stage presentation later this afternoon thank to the you. people here. We'll be back in about 10 minutes with really fascinating indie government strategy game, Democracy 3 Africa.
Hello, I'm back and we're, I'm here with Jeff from Stargazy. Hi. He's here to talk to us about Democracy 3 Africa, which is on the show floor. You've been showing it to people over the last two days. How's your show been going so far? Oh, it's been marvellous. It's so good to be able to get out of my coding cave where <laughs> I've been for the last nine months and, um, and get the game into people's hands. It's mm. the first time it's been shown publicly um, since uh, the development started and really get good feedback about the game, um, how people are getting on with the interface and uh, even meeting people from the various countries that are modelling here uh, and getting uh, their feedback on, on the political situations that we're modelling. It's really, really interesting. So Democracy is a series, but not only is Africa a very different game, I also anticipate that a lot of people watching this maybe haven't played a Democracy game before or know so what you do or how you do it. So we've got the game here, we can maybe run through a few basics. If we can yeah, the absolutely. Game. So, um, Democracy as a series uh, models the political, economic and social um, situations in various uh, societies and the way it does that is through quite a, um, a complex and nuanced simulation. Uh, but the actual interaction that you have with that sandbox, that political and economic sandbox, is uh, policy decisions. So new policy, cancel policies, tweak policies, and it's up to you to govern through that interaction loop and uh, to play around in that sandbox and build the society in a way that you want to see it built. And uh, there's no right or wrong way of doing that. You just have to be able to get re-elected. So don't anger the electorate too much with what you're doing. Previous democracy games have, I think, or exclusively focused on sort of Western democracies. Correct, yes. Right? And, and, and forms of government that um, are relatively similar to one another in, in broad ways. This is a very different, from talking to you yesterday, this is a very different set of challenges from your perspective, but also for the player as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. The, um, the diversity of the regimes that you find in continental Africa uh, are, is so broad that the simulation has had to be added to to be able to um, allow you to explore the alcoves of that, those political and economic situations that just aren't apparent in the Western democracies that have been modelled so far. So there are all sorts of additions to the simulation such as stability, um, such as the uh, implementation of democratic, democratic process um, that are taken for granted in, a, in the previous simulation um, but needed to be modelled in a, as a dimension inside of this simulation. Before we go into more detail, why don't we fire up a campaign so people can see yes. exactly how this manifests itself. Yeah, so um, it's a fairly uh, intimidating uh, interface when you first load it up, so yeah, brace yourselves. Um, <laughs> But what we're going to do here is load up Mauritius. And this is the, the African miracle it's been dubbed. It's a, it's a very stable democracy. It's been an uninterrupted democracy since it started. Um, and a very good, strong um, economy uh, moved away from agricultural produce to uh, base its economy in services, which are very high yield and a good basis for an ongoing upward trend. So it's a great place to start as a beginner. You can customize the way that the, uh, the simulation starts, but we're just going to use the basic uh, mm. configuration that the game comes with. Notice your apathy slider there. Yes, yeah, voter apathy is very important because, um, like I said, you only get to play the game as long as you can be re-elected. So if you can't rock the votes, yeah. Yes, congratulations. 1.2 million people's uh, lives are now in your hands. It's a small country, a uh, small island nation off the east coast of Africa. So. Immediately when you, you see uh, the interface, it's very overwhelming for somebody who's not played the game before. But what you've got to bear in mind is this is just an infographic. It's right. just communicating information to you so that you can make your interesting policy decisions. The way that you make policy decisions is with your political capital, which is uh, indicated in a pool up in the top left. And with that, you're able to um, tweak your policy sliders here. Mm -hmm. your, in this case, it's a policy that's already been implemented. It's the implementation of a police force. And you can adjust how much you're spending on your police force here. But you may choose that you want to implement new policies as well. And there are many categories. And um, 
dozens and dozens of policies that are going to affect all aspects of your society and your economy. It's entirely up to you which where you want to go with them and where you want to start. But if we look at the, the UI as it is, everything in blue is a simulation value. So here we have a new simulation value for Democracy Three Africa, a very important uh, simulation value, which is infrastructure. Right. So um, being able to deliver your core services like education um, and health uh, require you to be able to do so over a resilient infrastructure network. And that's just simply not the case in a lot of African uh, countries. For sure. Um, so everything in blue is a simulation value and you can't impact directly. So I can have a look and see what's impacting my infrastructure, but there's no slider here. It's just in value. So the way that we actually implement change is through policies. So um, for instance, if we're over here having a quick look at maternity leave, not great in Mauritius. There's not a lot of maternity leave available for those who want it. Um, it Maybe it's something that you want to change, especially as the electorates who are represented in the center here, 50% uh, are roughly are women. This is a new voter group for Democracy Through Africa um, and is particularly uh, important in this game because gender inequality is um, such a massive issue across all African states. It's also obviously um, uh, an issue in the Western democracies that been modeled previously, but the significance of uh, the impact is, is much higher across Africa. So that's why the decision was made to add women. So we have simulation values that you can change with policies and situations that pop up as a result of the current state of the simulation. So green ones are good, so we're a highly stable um, a society in Mauritius, which is driving the use of residential credit facilities, and an active and lucrative stock exchange. So some things that if you were starting the game and you just wanted to come in and play it off the bat, you'd have a look at it and you've got two concerns perhaps. I want to fix negative situations that there are in the society and I want to please the electorate because I only get to play on if I get re-elected. Mm. There's a timer here, so we have 12 turns, each turn's a quarter of a year until the next election, 12 turns. So at the moment, I'm not very popular. The elderly love me, <laughs> so we must have some decent state pensions, which I believe uh, are contributing quite nicely here. Mm -hmm. Yep, state pensions, lovely. Uh, and the religious love me as well. Mm. Um, well, love's a strong word, they like me. They quite like you. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. So um, there are groups that I might focus on to try and activate the vote, because you can right. take the electorate who, um, who like you, and then if you can make th them love you, then they will get out and they will vote for you. And that is how you win an election. Pandering, you might call Exa that. Well, <laughs> there's that, and there's a certain amount of cynicism as well. If you yeah. start messing around seriously with uh, policy just before an election, mm. then uh, the uh, cynical nature of that will be recognized by the electorate and you won't get the bump that you were expecting. Mm. So um, if you're coming in and playing the game for the first time, you're probably looking at your electorate, seeing the composition of your electorate and who's happy with you and who's not, and trying to please them to get through the next election. And if you happen to fix a skill shortage in your country along the way, all the better. Mm. But like I say, it's a sandbox. You can play it any way you like. So you don't have to address the issues of your electorate. You don't even have to try and make them happy, especially not in Democracy Three Africa, because in one of the ways that it fundamentally differs from the original simulation is that you can take it in an authoritarian um, direction as well. Yeah. Because you don't have to have, to have a functional state, you don't necessarily have to have a great implementation of democracy. Mm. Um, it's possible. Uh, to to improve the lives of your electorate without using the machinations of democracy itself. If you, I don't know, suspend or obstruct democracy, does that not change the fail state of the game if you can't be taken from power? So um, you also have a problem with uh, activists. So right. if you have a liberal base in, in the electorate inside your country and you're massively ramping down democratic process, press freedom, um, the freedom of thought and association, mm. these sort of things are really going to anger your liberals and uh, they will militar up. If you get them right. really angry, you'll have activists that become military, military, military faction activists, mm. and then you suffer the risk of uh, being assassinated. So right. you may not even get to the next election to be voted <laughs> okay, out if you're, uh, if you're that um, extreme to, uh, to warrant it. 
I see. But there is a way of combating that. So if we look at your security here, um, the interesting thing about Mauritius is that uh, it doesn't have a big military. Its, um, its armed police force doubles as its military, a very small military footprint. Um, however, if you wanted to take it the way of an authoritarian regime, a wise thing to do would be to invest in security measures before you do, because then an assassination attempt may be made, but if your security is high, you may you you'll be able to uh, rebuff the attack. Right. So um, here, armed police is only is very low. Um, we don't have a very uh, large base of armed police. That's something that we might consider ramping up in order to deflect any assassination attempts. If we were going to go that if, way. If you're going to suspend. Uh, yes, of course. The other. Thing that uh, is probably a more conventional way to approach a game like this is to come in and try and boost GDP, boost education levels, and make everybody a lot more happy. Mm. The interesting thing about um, uh, Democracy Africa over the original game as well is that the stability of your country is going to change the demographic, demographic makeup as well. So you find that you have more conservatives in a less sto stable um, uh, society uh, where the economy is um, not good and uh, you have um, all sorts of other factors that contribute to your, your stability. If that's the case, then um, your stability is, is going to have an impact on all sorts of things uh, and it might be something that you want to focus on in turning it around. Mm. How do you factor in corruption? So I believe that's actually new to this series, am it I right? It is, and you can see it's, it's contributing to the stability here. So corruption is, um, it impacts all sorts of facets of life um, in the private and the public sector mm. and um, it's something that wasn't modelled in the original game but really ought to um, be a consideration in any, any society. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the way that um, it works is that it can, it can benefit you as a, a strong leader to have corruption in your society because it means you'll be able to have more, um, uh, more co consolidated strength at the top to implement your will. I see here it's driving up oil price. Uh, yes, in this case every time a barrel of oil is produced someone's taking a cut. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the way you can, you can uh, reduce corruption if you want to go that way is to um, implement kind of progressive policies like um, a government code of conduct or uh, perhaps uh, as something as um, uh, obvious as a anti-corruption agency, that sort of thing. But um, you know, taking uh, an African nation that uh, isn't modeled in uh, Democracy 3 Africa, but is an interesting case in point, is there's an authoritarian reg regime in Rwanda. Um, they have a lot of political goodwill behind them after coming to power, and they were able to make sweeping changes. And uh, the president decided that corruption was something he wanted to eliminate in his society, and brought in um, some progressive econ economists to advise policy choices. And some of them made them into the game, made into the game. So um, something that you might not think about necessarily is open plan offices. So if you tear so you can't out hide your email, all the oh yeah, if you tear out all the walls inside of your uh, government offices, there are fewer cubby holes for which um, backhand deals can go down. <laughs> so just get rid of the cubby holes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. There's nowhere to hide. Yeah. In terms of so you've had to simulate a, a real diversity of different states that work differently. And I'm presuming that when you begin a game as any one of these nations, their current situation is, is approximately true of, of their real policies and so on, yes. and economic status. Exactly. So um, although it's a single unified simulation that um, uh, models all of these uh, various mission starting points, the, the actual uh, simulation or starting point for each country is modeled on real world data. Mm. So over the, um, the development period, I'd say about half the development period has been deep research. So I realized that coming into this project that I had to start from a clean slate. Um, my own perceptions of uh, African sovereignties and Africa in general as a continent have been really heavily influenced by the lens of um, Western media, mm. which tends to be quite sensationalist and sporadic in its coverage. Right. Um, so I wanted to strip it all back and work from a clean slate and build uh, the story of each country and parameterize each country with data, with the story that the data told. So I've built up this enormous amount of uh, information that I call the mega matrix, um, which has got you know dozens and dozens of economic, political, and social indicators in it that have been used to inform how the simulation needed to change for democracy through African democracy, and also where those countries are going to start in the game 
game space mm. as uh, parameterizing the simulation. So uh, it's a, it was a data-driven design um, that was really important for me personally. So there's as much objectivity um, and realism imbued in the project as possible. Given how data-driven it is, and I think maybe some of the previous democracy games have encountered this issue in other ways, how do you prevent a player from gaming the system or from finding ways to, you know, massage numbers to simply to quote unquote win? It's a, yeah. What winning means is really interesting when your game is about simulating actual Quite right. society, but nonetheless. Let's say that you, you decided that winning the game for you was to have the um, the most GDP possible um, for your society. Uh, it's not an obvious path to getting that. Even as a developer, um, I would struggle to tell you that the, the min-max uh, configuration to lead you down that winning path that you've determined uh, as your goal. Um, the reason for that is, is because you can see the number of different inputs there are into the simulation and the number of elements of the simulation that are being modeled and they all feed each other. So if I hover over um, various uh, uh, neurons, they're called, uh, because it is a neural network of um, interactions, uh, everything is impacting everything else. And um, although you can see the direct effect of uh, a policy decision or a simulation on any other neuron in this way, the proxy effect on other neurons, the, the trickle-down effect, the butterfly effect across the entire simulation mm. is too complex to um, fully understand the ramifications of any one individual decision. So ultimately a player has to make the policy decisions they make based on what they understand about the world and economics and politics, not mm. simply how different nodes or, yeah. or neurons interact with one another behind the scenes. Ultimately you're a politician and uh, you <laughs> must uh, work with the information that you're given mm. and uh, uh, I like a lot of politics. I think it's um, a lot of gut feel and um, not necessarily working with all the information at all times. It's interesting you say that because I was going to ask. You know, you presumably though, for the first time, you're working with pretty good information. You're working with perfect information, which must interact with how the, how the simulation of politics itself can mm. function necessarily. Is there any way in which the data you're given here is incorrect? Um, there is an obfuscation. Uh, so if, if you if you have a policy in the wild, you can imagine that you'd be po using polls to find out what the impact is uh, of that policy and how it's altering the society that it's in. But if you're selecting a policy for um, as a policy idea, you don't actually know what the impact is going to be until you've selected the policy. So there's a there's a a general feel for how popular it's going to be with the voters, with the electorate, but until you get it into the wild, you don't really know what the impact is going to be. You don't know what the cause and the effect is going to be. Right. So you've had the Game On show here at the weekend for two days now, mm. or day and a half. It's obviously, it's such a deep thing. I can imagine this is the type of game someone will spend a weekend over sort of tugging at the different parts of the simulation. Yeah. What's it been like getting that to people in an environment like this, in a, in a big hall full of games? What's the response been like? It's, it's actually been surprisingly good. I, I, you know, like I said, when you see the, the infographic um, UI for the first time, it can be quite intimidating. So anybody who's looked a little bit amused as they come past the stand, I've leapt out and grabbed them. So don't worry, it's, it's only an infographic. You know, the actual interaction loop is policy decision. And that's all you're doing is implementing policies, tweaking policies and cancelling policies. And um, then people get tend to get a bit more on board with it um, when you uh, explain the blue values. You can't even you can't even interact with the blue values. They're just there to let you know how you're doing. Um, so it's, it's been really good. And I ramped down the amount of um, inertia there was in the system. So you know, it takes a long time to implement some policies in real world. Mm. And that's, implemented, that, that's um, modeled in the game. But so I've taken away a lot of that uh, inertia so that people can come and have a, a, a really interesting play experience in a show environment where you want to see um, the fruits of your labor within a very short time period. So that's helped as well. So you let people just sort of change something and then immediately see 
the havoc that they've wrought on. Exactly, on yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the volatility in the simulation is much higher in, in this show build. How, how far along is the, the game now? Like, how close to completion in Sailor? We're, we're getting pretty close. Uh, this is um, a demo with seven of the ten countries in it available to play at the show. Uh, we're still balancing, but we're pretty happy with the way that um, those seven are feeling right now. And um, we're, we're gunning for a March release, so by the end of the month, we would, we would love to have it in people's hands. Great. Jeff, thank you very much for joining me on the stream. Well, thank you. We'll be back in 10 minutes to hear from Relic about the latest updates to Dawn of War 2 Retribution.
Hey there everyone, we're back and I'm here with Kelly from Relic to talk about the latest update for Dawn of War 2 Retribution, right? Which you've, yep. you've had here at the show, lots of people have played it already. Yep. Doing this for a day and a half, like, what's it been like, kind of like, showing people this game again and, and kind of bringing them through some new stuff? It's really good. A lot of people have come by and be like, oh, I used to remember playing this game, you know. It has been five years uh, since Retribution was released, and also seven years uh, since Dawn of War 2 was released. Still really old. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it has like re-engaged a lot of people and they're like, oh, you guys are updating it still? That's awesome. So, yeah, so it's really, it's been really positive. So I'm really glad that we're still able to add content and everything like that. Just because, yeah, we still have such a strong community for it. I guess, I mean, I guess the question a lot of people are asking, maybe if they weren't aware that you were coming back to the game, is mm. kind of like, why now? Like, why release a, a substantial update to a game that, as you say, is five years old? Like, what was the genesis of that? And, and yeah. Yeah, we've had like over the past couple of years, we had a lot of promotions that really did re-engage the community. So we do have a very very strong live community it re-engaged a lot of people that have been there since the beginning um, and it's also re-engaged a lot of new fans so we really wanted to give back and you know this was something that the community have wanted for quite some time uh, went through all of the forums because we really wanted to add something just for you know just for yeah we really wanted to add something so we looked through all the forums um, all the requests and, and the Necron Overlord was something that was the most requested yeah. so yeah Matt our uh, art director he was like yeah I can make something for that which is awesome so his art is amazing in it and it makes it look so good. Okay, well, let's take a look at the Necron Overlord. We can cut to there. We yeah, go. Um, so, so here he is. He's pretty sexy looking, which he is. is cool. <laughs> he looks really tough and really shiny. Um, obviously, yeah, he does come with a lot of other colors as well that we've incorporated, and he comes with a lot of abilities. Obviously, this is at level 20, so he has all the way up, he's up at the top level. So, all of the abilities have been unlocked for us already just to showcase this weekend. Um, and yeah, we've got quite a number of abilities. I've got a really strong staff that I've added. Um, this one, it revives me after a short period of time because that's something that the Necron is really strong with, which is, uh, yeah, reanimation as well as um, the Nightbringer as well, which I've added down here as, as, as an extra ability. So the two huge ones that I guess, oh, it's got three commander um, abilities. Right now I have activated the Nightbringer. The Nightbringer is just this, this Wraith Knight that comes out of the ground and he just kills everything within his vicinity, which is really cool. Uh, we've also got the uh, Resurrection Orb. Um, so that will actually, if, you're, if your allies are incapacitated or have died, you can actually throw that out and revive. Um, you can also throw that out prior to you just dying and it will revive yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the Tesseract Tomb here, which is the, um, it, will, it is able to lock enemies in place and it pretty much suppresses everyone in the area, which gives everyone else the ability to just pick them off really quickly. Um, so yeah. This guy, he's, he's not available as yet. Uh, we're showcasing him here at the PC Gamer Weekend uh, um, pre-launch. Pre so he's actually available as of Thursday, so the 10th. Right. Um, so we wanted to celebrate the five year anniversary of Retribution. And from the 10th till the 15th, if you download him, he's gonna be, it's free for right. five days, just to celebrate the five years of Retribution. And after that, he's gonna be at cost. So depending on where you are in the world, it will be a different yep. cost, obviously. Uh, 9.99 US, I think. So I believe the plan was to jump in and... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I can jump in and start showcasing it and see if I can add. I'm just going to add my party here. I've got um, a couple of people uh, ready to play with me, which is great. And these guys are at the show, actually, right? We're playing yeah. this from our live streaming <laughs> desk across to a couple of rooms away where the rest of the Relic team are kind of like standing by on exactly, actual yeah. machines. So, so fingers crossed they're going to be ready for me. Fingers crossed they're actually ready. Yep. This is the livest of live demos. <laughs> like with the Necron Overlord, like where does it? I, I, it is appropriate, right, for an Honestly? Egyptian space robot. It fits into the. Um, yeah. Like, um, where does it fit within the kind of, I guess, the, the team composition or the kind of your approach to the game? Like, what kind of playstyles is it good? For? He can be very slow, but he's very powerful. Um, there's a lot of builds that you can do, which is oh, it says searching, which is good. It depends on yeah what you add as your as your extra items mm -hmm. will depend on what strength he has because he can be a strong melee character, but he can also be a very strong support character, especially if you were to grab a lot of healing um, abilities added and the uh, the resurrection orb. He can be really just you can he can be at the background and like just dropping the orb whenever his right. teammates need support. So it depends on what you add as well. So should be searching. Little hand says it's time to rock and roll. <laughs> So we're just searching. So we should be able to connect to them. Sometimes it does take a little bit. We're on our separate build at the moment because it's on the beta build. Um, 
we just have to oh, search we're using, for like, the ones. actual matchmaker. So, yeah. Oh, here yeah. we go. There we go. So it's just going to take 30 seconds for it to actually be connected into the game, mm -hmm. uh, which will count down here. But yeah, obviously, last stand mode is a very it's it's it was a very popular mode um, that was introduced in Dawn of War 2. Um, and yeah, it's even a separate standalone game that you can buy on Steam as well. And yeah, it's a really popular mode, but it's very different. Like people have been coming up and being like, is this part of the RTS stuff? And I'm like, well, it's actually more Survivor in this one. So yeah. Yeah, pop in and then Survivor as long as possible. <laughs> When we spoke earlier, you mentioned that a lot of people coming by the booth were like Dawn of War 2 fans. They were like, oh man, I, you know, I remember this. But like, have you had many people encounter the game for the first time? Yeah, definitely, this? yeah. It's been really good because it does take um, it does take a little bit to get into just because there's so much that, you know, that can, yeah. With The Last Stand, it's much easier because really it's just like, you have to survive, right? And that's just your primary. That is a very orange and blue Necron Overlord down I know, I think they made colors. <laughs> <laughs> So, so all three of you are playing. Yeah, the we're all playing the Overlord. Yeah, so this one's pretty sexy, and I think the other one's actually like a brightly colored one as well. Have you gone for like different playstyles in your build, you know, or is this? Kind of I think so. Yeah. So they might be more melee. I'm a bit more like I'm gonna stay back um, because my safe. my weapon is a very very strong um, melee. Oh no, very strong ranged right. uh, weapon. So it's so powerful with people that are, are far away. So if you see it now, you can just fire and you'll probably kill it straight away. So for people who aren't necessarily familiar with, with retribution, like this is the stage in the waves where you can afford to take it, you know, take it a little bit more casually, right? Like yeah. it's not quite ramped up yet. Not as yet. It gets really, really difficult, I think up to like the ninth, yeah. ninth wave. We'll see how far we get. <laughs> I am distracted by how garish <laughs> that, oh God, that it? guy is. Oh, yeah, the, it's like the, right that, that is. <laughs> and he's got a pink staff too, which is yeah. nice. Necrons <laughs> traditionally considered to be quite easy to paint. Yes. But, uh, this guy is, uh, well, I know you're not painting it, but he's really going for it though. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. <laughs> the people back at the other builds. Let's have a look. So I will probably get out the neck, the. Um, the Nightbringer in a second. He's the only ability that I have down here because I did equip a lot of things that just make me faster, that make me uh, heal quicker, as well as me having less of a cooldown. So I don't have any more abilities down here, right. but it does make me quite. So powerful. you have a lot of passives. Yeah. A lot of passive ones. So yeah, that's why it's best that I stick behind and just fire it at the best. But there is a lot of other ones, like a couple of these. I think might have. They might have the Resurrection Orb to help me out. Um, but they might be more melee. Like this, I think, is more of a melee. Let's see. Let's see what he does. He's going to go over there and just smack him. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of things that you can add to the Necron to make him so powerful, but that can tend to slow him down a bit. That's one of the downfalls of the Necron. He can be very, very powerful. But if you select and you add so many things onto him, which is so powerful, you can sometimes be standing there because you have a long pull down. So you might not actually be very susceptible. Your race tech seems to, you seem to be doing quite a lot of work at the moment. Like yeah. that really powerful AOE, is that? Just reflective of how powerful the character is when you've gotten to this like pretty advanced level, or did yeah, you have there's that kind a lot of, like... of things that I have added that have made it much more powerful. Like the staff that I have, I don't think is is actually available until a little bit later. Um, but yeah, oh, I'm impressed. Nice. So I'm going in a sense of the kind of slow power rather than yeah. I think this guy has the same staff as me actually, so he's also arranged. I think, yeah, wave nine, it's gonna get a bit interesting. So once I actually get start being surrounded, I'll be able to bring the Nightbringer and actually let him go for it. Ah! Ah. Good, I'll do it now. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so because we're surrounded by a few things, I've dropped down my orb and he's gonna come out of the ground here. And he's gonna kill these people for me, which is nice. Here he goes. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's brought night. Yeah. Which go. is actually explosions, which I, yeah. Yeah. So he, he sort of throws down the same as the other um, two commander items do. So the Necron throws an orb that he has. So you can either have, yeah, the orb of, of resurrection, the Tesseract one, which is for suppression, or the Nightbringer. What? We're getting all boys. Oh, no. Oops. 
So more broadly, like, what's the, I guess, the hope for coming back to Retribution at this stage? Like, you mentioned it's the five-year anniversary of the game. There's obviously, like, a kind of just marking that occasion aspect to this. But yeah. is the hope that you'll kind of have, like, a new audience come to, to Dawn and Warner? Yeah, it is a very, you know, it's sort of a thank you for our long-standing communities as well. Like, at the same time, on the 10th as well, we're also bringing out a bug patch. Right. Um, now, this was based on all the feedback that we received from our past promotions. There was a lot of people that, you know, we did have our uh, Make War Not Love, and we also had the blood pack come out. And from that, it did gain a lot of new um, new players, but a lot of our old players were like, hey, you know, we would appreciate better if you would fix some of these key bugs that have been there since the start. So we were able to, because of those previous promotions, we were able to dedicate resources in order to fix those. And that was all based on the community sentiment. All the ones, like, I was able to reach out to our modder, uh, mods, as well as some of our key community members. Um, and yeah, really, really fix key bugs that were just so community prominent. So, so yeah. So this is kind of like the, I guess, the, the showcase new feature of what you're doing, but there's a lot behind the scenes as well. It's yeah. just quality of life stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of bugs that we're going to be hopefully fixing with this new patch that goes out. And yeah, so it's going to hopefully um, yeah, make the game last for much longer. Because it's already lasted five years, and, we, yeah. and we're so passionate about the IP, and we don't, you know, we really appreciate that it's still gone on for as long as it has. And yeah, it's a huge thank you. We really want to make sure that our community is happy with the, with the content that they have so they can keep playing for a long time. And a big shout out also as well to our uh, elite mods as well. Yeah. They've, they've been a really big key part of keeping this game alive because they've been able to fix, um, they've been able to give it the consistent support that we weren't able to in, right. in, in the past. I noticed earlier the um, orange and blue Necron analog uh, teleported. Is that something, yeah. the direction you take the character in, in addition to the kind of more kind of like yeah. passive base, like back line kind mm. of like default? Yeah, so that's a good one to have if you're um, focusing more on melee. Because um, what you can do is you can get yourself into battle should your friends eat it, or, or you can get yourself out of battle should you be in strife. So it's this ability that you can just zap uh, a short distance just to get yourself in and out of strife. So we're approaching that wave nine. Oh my god. How, how well do you think this is going? <laughs> I think it's going okay. I don't think we've died yet, so no, I'm No, no one seems to have even... Yeah. So I think some people okay. were briefly inconvenienced, but like, no one's dead. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, nine is, is quite a difficult one. Um, how have people on the stand been doing? Like, uh, yeah. we had a conversation earlier about the guy who got to, what, the actual <laughs> final wave, but... Yeah, we've actually had two sets, I think, of completed wave 20, yeah. which is the max. Great. Um, which has been, yeah. Were those guys so like good. existing players showing off? Or? Yeah, there were existing players, which is really good to, to showcase. And it was really good as well, because uh, on the Sega stand, we've had scratch cards. I don't know if you. Mm. Yeah, but everyone that plays any of the Sega games that are currently being showcased. Um, I think they, we talked about this earlier, actually, on the stream. Did oh, you yeah? the guy win? And yeah, they had a, yeah. yeah they, he won while he was playing the last stand, but he was on like the 19th, oh, I think. When they bring it. Uh. There he goes. I'm dying at the moment, I think. You bailed oh, out no. by death, well, so that's cool. I'm going to stick by this guy and he's going to help <laughs> me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was actually, he won it. He scratched it while he was playing. I think it was on the 18th wave. Mm. And then we're like, dude, you won, you won. And he was like, whoa, he was excited, but he didn't want to, because it's such a tough, like once you get towards <laughs> the end, it's so tough. So he didn't want to like, yeah, get away from his playing, but he was so excited. Oh, we beat wave nine, so we're good. You good? Yeah, I think That's, we're okay. That sounds like hubris. Well, now it gets now it gets really hard. Okay, this fine. Wave nine is where it ramps up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually I'm really curious to see how far we can get on the stream. Yeah, this. I know, right? How much time do we have? We've got we've got another <laughs> seven minutes. We're good. Oh, we're all right. We can, we can do that. We can do that. You can either win yeah, or fail at the time. All right, so he's going to drop down the orb, so it's over here. That, does he even have a pink star? I think he does, yeah. That's amazing. Ah, there he is. That's incredibly garish. I think all of my people are over here, though. Damn, we want to kill these ones, not the ones over here. <laughs> I put him in the wrong place. That awkward moment where you put them, then I bring him in the wrong place. Yep. Yeah. Damn. Happens to everybody. Yep. <laughs> It happens as well. Like sometimes you, if you've got the the resurrection orb and you drop it, and you're like, oh, whoops, I didn't actually drop it anywhere near where people actually need resurrecting. Oh, see, I think someone did just then. You should, because none of you have died, uh, we haven't really seen. We the haven't resurrection seen the resurrection orb. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we need to die first. So it sounds like it'd be a really powerful thing to have in a mode like this, right? Which yeah. Which is defined by not dying. Yeah. Um, 
A good practice to have. I think one of the ones that actually, um, one of the builds that beat the Wave 20, one of them, two of them were in melee or attack mode, and the other one was mainly support. So he had a lot of speed and he had um, the resurrection orb. So he could run away from the battle and just kind of keep himself out of strife. Right. And then whenever we needed to, we needed help, um, he would just come in and save us. And that's how they kept on like. So the guys that actually, the players that to beat the whole thing this weekend of, of, of like you've been using triple Necron. Yep. Cool. Yep. It's been really good. We've we haven't had luck yet um, meeting with with mixed, but you know. Okay. Is haven't. there any sort of obvious synergy there, like in terms of you know, with existing characters that people are aware of? Mm. Somebody mentioned, I don't, we haven't tested it in practice yet, but somebody mentioned like, oh, you could possibly have two Necrons and then the Chaos Warrior, and then you could sort of doppelganger and then have another Necron and just sort of sit back and see how you go. But we're not sure how that would actually fare well, yet. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it's new, right? A lot of people, we haven't had a chance to play it on a huge audience, so we right. haven't, yeah, we haven't actually had a chance to, to test all the builds and which one would be. Yeah. How, um, how, like, how big is the team still working on Retribution at Relic now? Like, you know, it is a it. small team, which is, you know, you why it took. There. Oh no, I think we've got the resurrection all happening now. Good news, everybody. <laughs> We're all survived, we're all good. You might need. I'm gonna get this night bring up. Yeah. I think this is if there was ever a time for night. No. Oh no. Where am I? Right, I well, we will find after wave nine. That was that was the promise. <laughs> Come on, kill them all. I'm dead. They're insufficiently convinced that it's my time. Oh no. Oh. Oh, it's close. <laughs> is it close? I can't tell anymore. I don't know. Who has the Someone might have the, I don't, I don't know which ones, I don't know which one might have, if is, anybody is has anyone the still alive? I think there's a... Yeah, we've got one person here. He's running away. <laughs> he said running, Kelly. Yeah. yeah. He's Slowly swaggering, swaggering away. swaggering with yeah. his pink there's staff. Actually, the pink staff and the glittery cape. Is that, there's quite oh, a lot no, of swag impressed. to yeah. this Necron Overlord. It's not something I necessarily always envisaged when I thought about the miniatures, but yeah. he's got a bit of style. He does. That's what's great about um, yeah, Warhammer 40k and all the miniatures actually from Games Workshop. You, you can, oh look, he's gonna oh, help us, he's gonna help us. Saved. Um, you can paint them however you want. Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. Oh, he's got a healing ability on, so he's gonna be... <laughs> Is that he's, I think he's gonna try to kill him before actually reviving us. Uh, someone is revived, right? Is it you? Is it me? It is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, am I? <laughs> Perfect. Oh, got it. We got through it. We're going to be okay. Three minutes to go. Oh my god. We can do this. I don't know we if can we not can. fail by way of the team. We should just keep going. <laughs> See, I'm, my strength is a multiplayer. I'm much better at multiplayer. So this is like... As in competitive? Yep. Right. So I like going against usually 3v3 three 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 or something. Having a whole team against a whole team, which is really fun. Oh, we've got all boys coming at us. All right, time for... Let's see if I can do it somewhere in the middle. See, that's what I like about my build right now. I can sort of stand wherever he is, and I cannot get hit because I've got him protecting me, and then I can do range. But right now, I've got the orbs, and they've got bombs. So, <laughs> right now, I'm not doing all that. It's not working out too well for me. Going okay. Yeah. But we're going okay. Because they're ranged as well, and I'm ranged, so. So, you mentioned that fire. Those five days we will be able to download Necron yep. Overlord for free. When does that begin? You may have said earlier, but I Yeah, so it's the 10th of uh, 10th. So, so it's 10th. on Thursday. Thursday's week. Cool. Thursday, yeah. It's probably going to be uh, like 10 or something, which is Canadian time, because that's where our office is. Right. But it will be, it might be, I think it's 6 p.m. 10 UK Canadian time. time would be like 3 in the afternoon UK time. I think it's 6 actually, p.m. No, actually, you're on the West Coast of Canada. Yeah. So yeah. no, it would be, be late than that. Yeah, I you're think right. It's, I think it's 6 p.m. 6, p. yeah. yeah. And then, so yeah. 7 p.m. Europe. So there was, there was some confusion when it first was um, communicated that it was only going to be free to play for five days, but that's not true. As soon as you download it, it means so that you own it. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So See. as long as you, you own Retribution, or at least the last stand mode, you'll be fine. Because this is a DLC for The Last Stand, um, or for Retribution. No, I think I'm dead. Approximately how badly is this going now? Right now, we're not going very well. Okay. We've all got, it's all, oh no, because this guy has a, a regenerate. He's fine. Yeah, he's, he's actually, okay. I hate to say, he seems to be carrying this. <laughs> he seems to be going pretty the, well. <laughs> the, the swag overlord is kind of 
We're going okay, we're on 14. Yeah, we may have to we're imminently okay. cut away from the, the ongoing adventures of three Necron overlords. Yeah. yeah, so Thursday this week, people can play it. If they're at the show, obviously they can play it right now. They can play it right now. Your booth. Uh, wait, well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on to, okay, to show us. It's me. really fun to see a game like this. It's so well loved, kind of get, it is, get yeah. care and support. It's, it's a really effect. loved game, and we're so glad that we're able to dedicate resources to it and still, yeah. and still keep it alive and still have that solid fan base, so it's really cool. Unfortunately, we will probably never get to find out if you're actually going to pull this off, but based on what's currently gonna, happening in game. I'm just going to do the Nightbringer again. Yeah, okay, let's one last Nightbringer in the round. I'll be right, yeah. <laughs> We can like cut away to me dying. <laughs> <laughs> we can cut away before that happens. Always. <laughs> but I think that wave 16 is where we fight ourselves. Um, because it's the okay, I'll have to get that way, but uh, will we? I think we're going pretty well. We're yeah. okay. Because the Nightbringer does a bit of a cool down. There's a bit of a wait in order to... You, you seem to have, you see, like, given that you're also talking to me, Throughout this demo, it seems to have gone remarkably, remarkably well. I was prepared yeah. for the eventuality where, like, once an eye bring is out, I yeah. can sort of just stand around him and just watch him do the chaos Great. around me, and I'm like, all right, cool. Yeah. And also because I'm on range, as long as I have, like, I've given him. If you're a slow character, it makes sense to never want to ever move. So, yeah. yeah, I think you're going to get through. I think, I you're think getting we're through okay. Range. I think this build is okay. 15. All right, let's, let's stick it out a little bit longer so we can find out. Uh, yeah, this build kept because you came by earlier and you we weren't go. happy with your build at all, wait. Yeah. But yeah, there's lots of other abilities that you can add for it as well. Lots of other cool ones that we have. So yeah, once it's released on the 10th, I'm sure that the last stand is going to be just full of the Necron for like ages. Yeah, that's because it's happen, new, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, but fingers crossed there's going to be a lot of matches that are going to be available. So people, yeah. Let's finish up. Let's see uh, actually, if you can beat three oh, Necron. these are ourselves, yeah. Yeah. See, look, we got It'd be amazing if we, yeah, three on three right now. Oh no, it's fighting me from over here. We need to get him. I'm gonna die. Hi. I think I'm dying. I'm gonna call the Nightbringer. I think I've called him in the wrong place though, because he's way over here. A misaligned Nightbringer. Yep. Oh, there you go. And I'm dead. Okay. You just I need think... to bring him over here. <laughs> I think that is the point we're gonna have to end on. <laughs> oh, well, as you get resurrected by your hero teammate who doesn't know that our time is up. But yeah, Kelly, once yeah, again, thank resurrected. you so much for coming on the stream. That's right. Thanks so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. We will be back in about 10 minutes with Wargaming to talk about the resurrected Master of Orion.
Hi, we're back, and I'm here with Chris from Wargaming, Director of Product Vision on Master of Orion. Chris, thank you for joining me on the live stream. Can you tell me a bit, like, especially for a stream audience who might not be familiar with Master of Orion, like, give me the broad strokes, like, what is Master of Orion, why is it exciting, why should I be excited, etc. So Master of Orion is a pretty well-known IP. Um, it, the original game came out in the uh, early 90s, and there were three in the series. They all did very well, and it was kind of the foundation of a, a new genre of, of 4X games. The term 4X stands for um, explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. And uh, that, that was actually coined for Master of Orion, the original game, um, by Alan Emrich, who was one of the, the co-authors of the original strategy guide for Master of Orion, um, and who's also one of the advisors on our, our team. And uh, so this kind of game, you uh, play your turns out to, uh, to, to conquer the galaxy. You can, you can conquer it by diplomacy, you can conquer by um, you know, military might, you can conquer through uh, research and technology. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but you, the goal is to, to spread your colonies out inhabit systems and, and planets, manage your population, your growth, your research, your, your military production uh, and, and improvements, and then uh, continue to move through the galaxy encountering these other alien races as you go. So I guess the question is, this is, this is not it was a reboot, right? Like you're resurrecting this, this series that right. was incredibly beloved and has been idle for a very long time. Well, very long in the history of in history of game sense. Like, why Master of Orion? Like, why come back to this specific series? So, now? so for many of us, this age, yeah. uh, you know, that that was a real uh, experience for us. Our CEO Victor Kisley loved that game. Uh, he credits it as his kind of his MBA. He he learned how to manage resources, how to be careful with resources, how to grow an empire, how to uh, negotiate, and all these other things through a game as a teenager. And later on, he used that experience to build up a you know a game company into right. a, a fantastically successful um, you know, global company. And so. Um, so he loved this IP, and a few years ago, you know, Atari was on the ropes. They're kind of going out of business, and they said, "Okay, we're going to put up this IP for sale." And he said, "I got to have that," and uh, so we did. You know, we went out and got it. It's war gaming; we're unstoppable. <laughs> and uh, so we went out. We went out and bought the IP. And uh, my first question to Victor is, "So, who gets to make this?" Well. We were approached by a studio in Argentina that had found out that, of course, that we had the IP. And they reminded us a lot of wargaming before we were super successful with World of Tanks. Um, we had been making real-time strategy games and turn-based strategy games uh, for like 15 years. And this is really our, our DNA, is this kind of game. And so uh, they approached us with a prototype. And they were extremely passionate. It was beautiful. We knew they were going to be able to do a good job. So we signed them on. And uh, for the past two years, we've been working on the game. So what is it, like, from that point, what does it take in to get this? I mean, because you, you're launched now to a, in a, in a, is that a first wave release now? We're in early access. Right, right. in early access. That's what I mean. Yeah. So you've gotten it to that state in that time. What is it taking to translate Master of Orion? Like, are there things that you've wanted to change about those original games? Or has this been a, a kind of one of those, like, love letter projects where it's about resurrecting something? Well, you? this game, let's face it, it's never going to make as much as World of Tanks. Right. Like, World of Tanks is a huge success. This game was, we made this out of passion, out of love for the genre. And because we want our kids to have the kind of same experience that we had 20 years ago. Uh, we want other people outside of the hardcore 4X player space um, to be brought into that space so that all 4X games can be improved by having a, a much larger audience and, and be able to grow. So uh, we, we've, we looked at, of course, at the, at the original series. We decided we would keep the story of the original Master of Orion, the original 10 races, the Orion planet, the Guardian, all these things. Um, but we also looked at what features should we take from the other games. You know, take a few from here, a few from there, the best ones that we wanted to fit into it to keep that that feeling of, I just want to play one more turn. I want to finish this research. I want to finish this battle. I want to, um, you know, grow another uh, colony. And so we have people, you know, <laughs> I think one of our biggest complaints is from people is, um, hey, I didn't get to sleep last night. <laughs> because right. I've been up all night playing. Uh, you, you can all of a sudden discover that you've been playing four, five, six hours and go, wow, this was a lot of fun. Really interesting. Uh, of course, it's only 80% done. We're in early access. We've got a lot still, still to do on it. Uh, but, but we know that. And we're trying now to get the feedback from the, from the players so that we can uh, finish it up to a standard that's going to be accessible to players, but also um, going to 
keep that same depth as the original games. Hundreds of technologies, the, the races, the de deep diplomacy, the star systems with different kinds of planets and so forth. Something that I guess you've announced recently but is kind of striking about the investment that presumably Wargaming has made in this is the, the voice cast that you've pulled together for what is ultimately like a, a game where the player's narrative is key, right? But you nonetheless have this, this extraordinarily kind of like star-studded cast of actors. We do have video, I believe, that we can throw to to see some of this. In Master of Orion, we pulled out all the stops with a top-tier voiceover cast, comprised of stars from well-known science fiction properties. I'm Mark Hamill, and I play the Alkari Emperor in Master of Orion. We Alkari are to rule over every horizon, even yours. It is the will of the Sky God. The Alkari is a benevolent race, and so they're interested in exploring and expanding. And the, uh, the way it was explained to me, which I like a lot, is exploring is seeing what's around the corner, expanding is seeing what's around the corner and planting your flag on it. And it's nice to be associated with a, a species that is so aspirational. Hi, I'm Kat Cressida, and I am playing the Mershon Empress. I look at your mewling fleet and wonder, who put the cat among the pigeons? What truly struck me the first time I got to see the, the new rebooted version is how fully evolved the ships are, the universe, the strategy. It is so fully immersive, and you really feel like you are in this completely new universe. Diplomatic relations between the Bulrothi Empire and the al Kari flock have worsened. My name is Dwight Schultz, and I voice the lead anchor on GNN. I remember playing it. It was one of the first video games I played on my PC. It's much better than I remember. It's so much better. Greetings, controller. Our labs are staffed and ready to start researching. I'm the Cylon advisor. Cylon? But not the v -v -v kind. The kind of <laughs> kind. Oh, yes, the military probing agency would like us to invest in this. His um, metabolism's run a little hot. He can eat whatever he wants, which, you know, there's an inner happiness there. You obtuse piece of flotsam. It was folly to trust you in the first place. I'm John Delancey. I play the human emperor in Master of Orion. The elements of the original game you, you, you recognize as being 20 years ago. The essence of it has been reproduced. The blood, the, the, you know, the, the organs of it are, are still there, and, and the spirit of it is still there. And so it came to pass that the Alkari flock took roost on Orion. I'm John Kassir. I'm playing the Alkari advisor. Welcome, your highness. What wisdom do you seek? This video game's not only classic, it's legendary. When I look at what the game used to look like and what it looks like now, it's even more fun to play and then it has a lot added to it. Plus, it's visually incredibly pleasing to watch. We have an amazing brand new race that we're introducing for the first time, the Terran Khani. I'm Robert England, and I am playing the Khan in Master of Orion. Long have my people suffered in the past, but be warned, we will abide no more. I see the Khan as these sort of galactic refugees. Now, they're, they're humans, but uh, they've been through the grinder. They've been forged by war. Think of them as, as Vikings in space. It is for the good of the common people that you must be deposed. We come not as conquerors, but liberators. We are taking this game to the height of our technology of the modern age, and that is AAA graphics, that is immersive gameplay, that means a polished presentation that is designed for a new generation of gamers. Master of Orion, conquer the stars! Why will the flock conquer the stars? Look to the skies for adventure. Rise from the ashes. Take to the skies in Master of Orion.
Awesome. Well, I guess having seen that like now, the audience will understand the kind of breadth of sci-fi fandom covered by that list of people. Well, right? well we're big sci-fi fans too. I, right? We can tell. Like, it's it's definitely notable. It's, it's unusual for a game of this type, like a big fork strategy game, to have that deep investment in getting this sort of cinematic quality story presentation and sort of character presentation in there. Like, why was that important to you? Well. While the old games sometimes seem to be about crunching numbers and managing spreadsheets, we wanted to really be able to get inside the player's head and have them tell themselves a story. Here's how I'm coming to become an, an emperor of this galaxy. Here's the real people. We wanted the characters to feel like real, you know, real people. So we wanted top-rate rate actors um, with recognizable voices. And uh, of course, it doesn't hurt that they're from science fiction IP. So you know, when you listen to Mark Hamill, you're thinking, "Wow, you know, I, I know this. I know this voice." Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a it's a good fit for us, and uh, we just we want this game to be as high quality and high, highly polished as possible. What was the selection process like? Because it it feels like it was just like okay, who do we, who do we like from all the sci-fi we like? Yeah. But, like yeah, how did you go about? It, it, pick, was, it was kind of a combination of uh, who do we like and who's available, right? right. Uh, you know, I would love to have Leonard, Leonard Nimoy. Of course, he's dead. Okay. So we can't yeah. do that, right? It's unfortunate. Uh, th but. Uh, you know, we, we, we talked to a lot of different people, and we got we got the best people we could get, and they're fantastic. Really, there's so many different actors out there that are really excellent. Um, it was actually hard to choose. Right? Did they take to it quickly that cast? Like, um, did they kind of pick up the brief quickly and what they were kind of ex expected to the experience they were expected to create for the player? Yes. In fact, we uh, demonstrated the game to them at that time, which was way before Alpha even, and, and showed it to them, showed them their uh, their characters, models, and what they looked like. And their artwork, uh, and they were like really excited about it. And the ones that kn knew about the game were even more excited because, oh wow, I remember this from way back when. And, uh, so they they really got into it very quickly. Some of them, uh, the the lines, if you remember in Master of Ryan, was pretty corny. You know, some of the lines were, they were a little cheesy. GNN and so forth. GNN is still pretty cheesy, right? Lines. And it's supposed to be. It's it's that kind of um, you know. The, 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 the uh, it's kind of self-deprecating humor of, of the genre, and so uh, you know some of these guys, some of these guys were cracking up and crying while we were doing these lines because they were so funny. Uh, but they did a great job of, of bringing across sometimes anger and sometimes happiness and sometimes fear. And, and we have a, a, a really deep diplomatic system so that the uh, the AI races will actually respond to you uh, in a different way based on how they how they feel about you as a as a uh, as a character. It's like tonally, Master of Orion is, is relatively light. Like you said, you know, it can be cheesy. All the originals can be cheesy right. in places, but like it's it's definitely not maybe not gritty. I don't think of a word to use. You have you know monsters and kind of like you know war and themes. Of, right. But right. like it, it tends to be pretty. It lightens it up a yeah. bit from the the fact that yes, you're just you know invading planets, mm. um, conquering other races. It's like well. Okay, it's just a game. Let's keep it at the game level, but it's still an important story for the player because it's it's fun and of course because there's a hundred thousand random seeds and five different ways to win and uh, you know ten races and all these other things. You can play it over and over and over, and it'll be different every time. So each time you want it to be able to see different, you know, maybe interact with different races that are closer to you. Have your advisor be different because you're playing a different race, and and each time it should be just as as appealing and deep as the first time. It was it a challenge then to put together? the you know the, the voices and the scripts of these characters knowing that the player is likely to encounter all of these characters multiple times over the course of their life of the game but also from different angles as as they play the game differently and they take a different tack well right so if you you know want to you're going to interact of course mostly with the races that are nearest to you right. in the galaxy uh, if you play it again, you may play as a different race. Well, you won't actually encounter the emperor from that race because that's you. Right. But you'll encounter the advisor. So each time you play it as a different race, you'll get a different advisor, and you'll be encountering some of the same races again, but some of them will probably be much more uh, interacted with. And then uh, some of them, you know, you'll be friends with, so you'll only get their friendly voices, but some of them you may be fighting and you get their angry voices. So it'll be a different experience with each race each time as well. You mentioned, like, this this caliber of voice cast giving an increased sense of the quality of the game, right? Like, does that also have, like, a 
sort of an outreach role to play in terms of getting people to try something like this? Because obviously, presumably, your, your audience is first and foremost people who go, oh, Master of Orion, I, I don't even remember that, but I miss it, right? But like, that, is that's, this... Right, that's the, kind of the first crowd, is, is the people who go, I, I've been waiting for this game since you announced it. Yeah. Uh, because I really know Master of Orion, I remember from 20 years ago. But beyond that core, um, there's a whole world out there uh, of people who play games who have never heard of Master of Orion. Uh, we have to, of course, appeal to them as well. And having uh, you know, top quality music by the original composer for Master of Orion 1, uh, the animation, the art style, uh, the variety of you know, top of the technology tree, uh, ships and, and, and combat systems, uh, and the voice acting will bring people to at least look at it and go, let me give this a try. And who knows, you know, someone might be playing it, they might be a teenager, they're playing it, they're really enjoying it, and you know, one of their parents comes over and says, is that Master of Orion? Yeah. I played that 20 years ago, it looked completely different. Let me try. Yeah. You know? um, and that's the kind of thing that, that we wanted, like I said earlier, you know, we want to play this with our kids. And we want them to experience the same kind of the feelings that we had about it when we were kids. But they won't play that game. They won't play the game from 20 years ago because they'll listen to the beep, beep, beep music and, yeah. and you know there's no voices and it's just read a bunch of text and move a bunch of numbers and you know 256 colors. You know if you go out and try to play it again, I'm sure the game was balanced, it was fun, it was deep, and we brought all that forward. Um, but it it wouldn't stand up to today's technology and expectations of interface from from modern players. What is the you've got it out in front of the public now? I mean not just here at this event but but globally. Um, what has the response been like, like based on your expectations as well? Uh, it's actually vastly exceeded our, pred our predictions, <laughs> right. and uh, and I thought our predictions were pretty on the mark, but really, uh, people are enjoying this game quite a bit, and it's in early access. It's only 80% done. We still have uh, a lot of features to, to put into the game that we've already done but taken out for polish. Uh, we have more races to put in the game. Uh, we have a lot of, of balancing to do, and yet, the people are still staying up all night playing, so gotta be good. What's the early access process been like for you? Because I guess, speaking of, of wargaming generally, you've run betas and stuff for, for zero other projects, but is this your first time in this early This is our first time doing your What's early that access. experience been like? Uh, it's very intense on our community management people. We ha it takes a lot of work in uh, forums, both um, in forums on Steam, on GOG, um, in, in, on our website, and throughout the different regions. So, of course, you know, every, not just Europe, the US, CIS, all over, we have people who are managing these, these forums, the communities, and getting feedback because we want that feedback. Uh, I had a four hour meeting the other night with the um, studio heads uh, about you know, what are, what's our main focus for the next few weeks? Uh, because we have gathered all this feedback, we spent five days gathering the first feedback from uh, early access, and I said, hey, this is, this is what the players have found, this is how the players feel, we need to use that, we want, we want the players to be happy, so this is where we're working. Even a project of this scale, are you able to be like pretty responsive or reactive with that feedback as it comes in? Actually, we are. It depends on, uh, of course, the, the nature of the request. So if somebody says, hey, you know what, um, I don't like any of these voices, <laughs> pick all different stars, that's yeah, not going to no, happen. Probably that's not. Not gonna happen. Uh, you know, or, or hey, I want a different race. Like uh, people are asking frequently, for example, for the the three races that were in Master Ryan Two. Well, we we're focusing on the story from Master Ryan One. We're going to stick with those races. If this game continues to be popular and does really well, who knows? We could add some DLC down the line. Awesome, Chris. Thank you very much for joining me on the live stream. Now it's your pleasure. pleasure. And you. I hope the rest of the game's development early access goes well. So thank you very much. Thank you. We will be back in ten minutes at four p.m. GMT with. Mountain Blade 2, Bannerlord.
Hello everyone, I have some news. Mountain Blade 2, Bannerlord, is right here. Oh, uh, here we are. Trick. <laughs> I'm nice joined by Stan here. and Frank from Telworlds, who will be taking us through basically the demo that you've now practiced on the stage yes, and right, delivering yeah, yeah, yeah. to a very excited group of internet people. We're yes, the hype, the hype is very much real yeah, right now. Um, it. Chat, chat is, uh, is, getting, is getting seriously into it, so uh, we can't wait. And um, uh, it's just exciting because it's like live gameplay as well, so anything can happen at the same done time. This before. Uh, on our stage downstairs, right? Like, no, this is like this is the biggest chunk of live gameplay we've ever shown um, to the public. We did like press things last year, but this is like public, uh, live gameplay from the new game. So it's yeah. uh, super exciting. Yeah. And this is yeah, this is coming directly to you for the first time. Well, ish. Um, yeah. Forty minutes of gameplay of Mount. Yeah, forty minutes. And I'm gonna let you guys lead this one because I'm kind of excited because I played a lot of Mount Blade as well. So. Yep, Should we get to the, <laughs> let's just get into it. Let's let's see. Okay, brilliantly. Uh, so I mean. I get the feeling that most people watching right now know what Mountain Blade is. Yeah, but it might be worth going into. Just in case, yeah. uh, what it is, it's like a, it's like a medieval sandbox um, uh, sort of world, which like combines action, RPG, strategy, and simulation, right? So it's a, it's a strange and interesting mix of genres, but it comes together in, in sort of compelling, unique ways. It will interconnect and then will sort of show how that works through the demo, and also the improvements that we've made in, in Battle Lord itself. Um, Battle Lord, of course, is Mountain Blade 2, so it's like our, our first full follow-up to like, the previous types in the series. Uh, it's a sequel, so it's set 200 years before the events of Warband. Uh, we've got a bigger map, uh, bigger battles, and, and all sorts of just exciting uh, new features in the game as well. So let's just awesome. let's get started, right? Yeah, awesome. I like the, both the banner and the Lord. And the banner and the Lord, yeah, yeah of course. Good. We've, de we've delivered on both fronts <laughs> yeah, so exactly. far. We're right, <laughs> we're done. Got it straight away. Awesome. So what are you, like, well, okay, if we're on the world map straight away. Um, okay, so what, this is like a uh, save that we're loading in to sort of show you um, some of the, the, the sort of uh, later gameplay rather than what you start off. Normally you start off as like a sort of nobody in the world, right? And you just have to carve your own destiny and, and become um, you know, someone in the world. We're actually a lord right now. Oh, wow. So we're like uh, a lord of the Britannian faction, which is like inspired by kind of Pictish, sort of Welsh, kind of um, uh, Celtic kind of uh, inspired faction we have, which is new to the game. Um, but before we get into the, the demo and talk about the game itself, we're actually going to go and uh, customize our character, right? Yes, and let's do it. Find someone to play them. So I'm going to take the reins here. So this is a oh, feature. Wow. And yeah, Stan's going to talk Okay, sorry. This is yeah, a feature that we've, uh, we're very excited about uh, showing. Um, since uh, Mountain Blade is an RPG, uh, making your own character, customizing your appearance is very important and we spend a lot of time making our customizable options both detailed and realistic. So uh, we have, oh, if you go to the body type please, uh, we have two different sliders for changing our body type weight and build. We can also change skin color, we can switch between voices and of course you can play female or male. Um, and um, we have, of course, a bunch of hairs and beards. Uh, we can switch between our eyebrows, uh, yeah. teeth type as well. Um, yeah, and which shows us another feature which is new in Bangalore, uh, facial animations. Although this, this isn't uh, completely put into the game in all situations just, just yet, it's fully supported in the engine whenever we want to, so. Um, Another thing about the GUI is that we've designed it so that uh, it's made to get quick results. You can go into each part of the face and randomize, or you can randomize all on this part. So, um, we have prepared a few phases that we're excited to show. Um, you want to take over? Yes, uh, let's just go through. Just uh, 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 I'm sorry? Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm doing it. With four. Okay, all right. This maybe some people would recognize. Um, and we have uh, this guy. And this guy, most people would recognize, I think. It's the it's the like the burlap sack pants that really make that one. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, uh, the face uh, customization tool is already very powerful, although this is a work in progress. And uh, we're very much looking forward to see what our creative players can do with this as well. And we're going to make uh, it very easy for players to share and save their creations uh, between each other. Awesome. Yes. It's a hell of a jawline. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I also have this guy. Oh, 
we'll finish once it's started. And so because this is like, um, this is the generic system that we use all of our characters in the game, right? It's not just uh, the player character, all of the characters that we have in the game use this. So it's really important that we can sort of create this kind of diversity and have a, a really powerful tool that, that we can use to make interesting looking characters that the player sort of uh, interacts with and remembers. Um, so that's, that's really been our goal with this, what we've been making yeah. as well. Another goal has also been making the en entire uh, workflow with this, uh, giving the player complete and full control. Uh, another slider will never move when you move uh, one slider. So uh, it's very easy to get into and, and, and be creative. And it's, it's, it's very important to let the player be full creative. So you presumably use this to create characters that you've, you've designed, but is the, is the randomization function also used to generate NPCs? Yeah, yeah, we also have, yeah, we can, like, have randomization. We can sort of have, like, um, make that specific as well. So like culturally, we'll get sort of um, people from different factions. We'll sort of look at different kind of way, um, have like different sort of, uh, you know, like specific sort of traits and features that you recognize from the different cultures as well. So yeah. that's like, it supports that. Completely. So, all right then, so uh, let's pick a face and then Yeah, and which one again. do you want to play as? Um, let's go. I think, let's go with six. Oh, yeah? pretty good, yeah. Looking pretty good, okay. All right, let's do this. Okay, so as we jump into the world map now, uh, what you can see here is, uh, it's, you know, it's similar to what we have in the previous games. It's a familiar kind of style of world map. Obviously, we've made it look much prettier, uh, add a lot of detail. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, what we can see is, uh, the names here, obviously the, the names of the different settlements at various locations in the game. And so when you're on the world map, you're still traveling between those, it's between battles and the various other interactions and, and, and gameplay aspects of the game. Uh, over on the west, where we have the, uh, in red, it's the Volandium faction. And this is sort of the spiritual ancestors sort of Swadia and the Rodox. Right. They're actually enemies with us in this game. And so this, these are the faction that we're gonna go over to, find one of their lords, and um, hopefully take them out in a big, big old battle. That's what we're gonna, yeah. that's what we're gonna work towards uh, through the demo and, and show at the end. Uh, so right now let's jump back to our own character. Still the same thing with the previous games. We, we click on the world map just to move around. As we move, everyone else moves. It's like simultaneous movement, right? So it's uh, still, still very much Mountain Blade. Um, uh, I mentioned before that we're a lord in this faction. Um, we don't have a very lordly host right now, though. It's just four, four of us and our companions. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to a local town and we're going to um, bring a garrison that we have there back into our party and then go around as a large army uh, for, for, the, for the large fight itself. So let's head towards uh, Dunglanis, a very sort of Welsh sounding name yeah. that we have for, for one of the, uh, the towns of Britannia. And so we showed off a little bit of, of our map before. We sort of really, really tried to work hard on making it look prettier, also present some more information as well. So you can see like around these villages, you get uh, information about what they're producing. This is like a, a tanning uh, area as well, so it's producing leather hides, that kind of thing. If we just pause here as well, so we see that we have this small party of uh, seven troops, and what it is is a bandit party, right? Mountain right. bandits, and what mountain bandits do, or any bandits, is they're bullies. So they're picking on our peasants, and they're disrupting the flow of our economy. Um, so what we want to do they're is they're chasing peasants there, right? No, these are that's more bandits actually. <laughs> <laughs> We're infested right now. And it's chasing all the bandits. Yeah, but we'll. Um, Let's get to a fight with these with these mountain bandits and, and try to take them out. We're actually slightly yeah. outnumbered, but relying on Sten's ability here, yeah, uh, for us, so. should, we should hopefully see us through. We're sort of pretty well equipped as well, so we have. Let's just jump straight into the fight. I think well, we could talk about uh, what we can see here a bit later on. And so we have like this. Uh, we have like a good two-handed sword. We have a horse. We have some, some decent gear, and uh, hopefully we can win this fight. <clears throat> so I mentioned already, it's like uh, action RPG strategy and simulation. And what we have in the battles is it's the action part of the game. It's still still the player skill is what counts. When you shoot an arrow, it's all it's all physically calculated. So if the arrow hits someone, that's what does damage. Nothing to do with your character. It's all still your your action gameplay, and that's what that's what's rewarded. This is lovely of the forest, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course, we have a lot of frightening our scenes now as well. So because it's like Britannia, we have like loads of forests around here, and it's obviously reflected in the scenes when you jump in the battle. We also have things like the, the spanning step and the, you know the deserts and the tundra in the north. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely uh, uh, <laughs> lobotomizing. Okay, and uh, so our companions are doing pretty well. Actually, actually, they've been taken out. Oh my god. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Uh, I got it. Hold out. Okay, so we've got this big weapon, right? It's still, it's still the, uh, the mountain play combat. You have a lot of direct control over your swings and. and uh, I like that your name is Phil. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's kind of. We, okay. Are we, are we won? No, this guy left. Okay, so we can take out our bow. Obviously, still our first and third person mounted his oh combat. A great variety of weaponry as well. Hey. <laughs> he went full Boromir there. Um, okay, so brilliant work. We took it. We took him down. You can see we have our big two-handed sword right here. Uh, if we just show off how the combat's still working, the, the, the blocks and the attack directions the same way. Uh, but we sort of deepened it and, and tried to make it a bit like harder to master at the same time. We've added lots of new animations, made it look smoother and, and more attractive as well. 
Uh, let's jump. Let's jump out of the battle then. Oh yeah, we get a bit of information here. We, we can show this in the in the large battle of the screens and the, the, the detail we get there. Let's grab the bandits, uh, prisoner. So fortunate enough to survive, but unfortunately not fortunate enough to avoid a life of slavery as when we set them <laughs> off. Uh, let's, let's let's head on there, and we can loot some of their gear as well. Rough fur armor, that looks pretty good. Let's let's grab that. That's cool. Sweet. Okay, nice. All right, let's continue into the Glanis. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Uh, okay. So when you enter a city, uh, this is what you get, a menu of options. You can join the tournament directly or visit the tavern or go to the castle and speak to lords. Um, we've improved these screens from our previous games. Now you can see which people are in the city and you can also see information about the city, its garrison and uh, the population's morale. Now the reason we give all these options is because it's always up to the player uh, if she wants to explore or not. And we reward this in different ways in Bangor as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, for now, we're going to pick up uh, our companion and the troops which we have garrisoned with him here. And he is in you the tavern. You can see he's in the tavern. Uh, yeah. from there, so. Now the taverns and uh, other parts of the city as well, um, the, we've worked a lot on creating atmosphere uh, and making uh, the world feel more alive uh, of Calradia. And the townspeople, companions, travelers, they're all coming into the tavern and drinking together. You can also sit with them. If you sit next to this guy, uh, he'll turn towards you and, and, and like hang out with you. <laughs> Um, there's also, since this is a Batanian town, um, you will see Batanian architecture, uh, people wear Batanian clothes, and they play Batanian music, and you can even play a Batanian uh, type board game, which we have, we have board games for all different uh, oh, wow. cultures. Six different board games. Yes. <laughs> it's a, a way you can earn money. You can, also, you can also play with lords uh, while discussing politics. So we're going to pick up uh, our companion. Uh, and our troops, and we're also going to ask him to follow us uh, because we're going to need him uh, in the town later. So this is sort of one of the ways that we're, we're really um, adding to the things that you can do in towns as well. So we've made the, the towns much more bigger and more interesting, but there's also much more gameplay there as well. There's much more right. things to do. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to show you, um, as we walk through a town, one of the ways in which you're, you can sort of uh, are rewarded for exploring around different areas. So we head out of the tavern, we find ourselves in the center of, of this Batanian town of Dunglanis. And uh, what we can do before we, before we do anything else, actually, is we can ask him to run around and gather up all of our companions in the, in the town. So he does that, oh, wow. he does that like, um, live. He's going to go run and get them. They're going to start running. So he's back. Actually, one, actually, is right. one, one was just saying that. <laughs> like a relay race. Yeah, That's exactly. Awesome. And he's going to start heading around and picking up everyone else as well. Um, but while he's doing that, we can, we can uh, walk around the town and uh, take a look at the marketplace as well. If you have a look, look up there, you can see the castle. So obviously that's where the Lord is. We can go up there, speak to him. The Verticatio feels very different to... Yeah, well, we, you know, it's a brand new engine. Uh, so graphically, obviously, the, the graphic fidelity is vastly improved yeah. over the previous game. And, and you know, there's so much more detail and attention paid to the scenes. And, and you can really feel the, the culture with all of our immersive like, different uh, features that we have, like so much of the music and all of this like, uh, great... Um, feeling of being in like a Batanian town that we have right now. Um, this is the marketplace, and obviously you can you can go there, to speak to the sellers. You can buy and sell goods, uh, of course yourself. Um, these sellers are sort of they are they're like the town sellers, right? So the profits that they make, a cut of those goes to the local lord. Mm -hmm. We also have a private enterprise. I'm going to sort of talk a bit about that in a second as well. So that's like a new feature in the game. Is, now, it, is, every, is everyone with us? Yeah, they're all here. All right, guys. Okay, so we, we, we're ready to show another new feature, we, which we're very excited about uh, as well. Highly player requested. It's uh, it's crime. Yes. Oh, awesome. So uh, let's, let's sort of see how this works again. You want to try yeah. and mess them up? I'm going to take over. Right. There's, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so as you can see here, um, there's some thugs here that has taken over this part of the city. Mm -hmm. And um, basically what you can do is that you can, um, you can mess them up and make sure that no crime is going on here. Let's provoke them, right? Yeah, let's provoke them. Let's uh, take this part of the town from them. Yes. Go. <laughs> nice. He didn't last long. Ah. 
Yeah, our companion's doing pretty well actually, I think. Nice. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Good job. You really, really murdered those guys. Yeah, they did much better than against the mountain bandits. Yeah. So uh, now we can place one of our own companions here, um, since they're all still alive. Um, <laughs> Uh, we couldn't do it in the last demo we did because uh, yeah, well they were killed. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, and uh, that that will uh, stop uh, other thugs from coming and uh, creating crime. So okay. we're, we're sort of helping the economy to, to be stabilized in the city. What we also can do, which is completely new uh, as well, of course, uh, if we have a companion that has the trait of being sort of criminal, we can start our own criminal enterprise here oh, and wow. take money for ourselves. And since uh, we're part of this faction and we know this lord who who uh, owns this city. That would cause a strain in our relationship if he would find out. So, but we don't care about that right now. But if you're ultimately interested in like destabilizing a city, you could yeah. start crime yeah. there first. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to earn money, uh, particularly early in the game. That's cool. Yes. Yeah, so now we got some uh, dudes here. <laughs> yeah, get these dudes are also on them. Okay. Um, so now that we covered the sort of the, the, the illegitimate uh, business of the game, um, we, can, we can look a bit, bit more at the more legitimate side of things in, uh, in the private enterprise I mentioned before. So the shops that are inside buildings, these are privately owned and they can be owned by, they could of course be owned by the local lord, but they could be owned by another lord, right? Or a merchant or a player. And so you can buy these and they're also really dependent on local supplies. It's a blacksmith and what it's doing is it's getting a supply of, of iron ore from local villages, turning it into weapons and then selling them to, to caravans and the train around the map. So we have a really sort of fully simulated working economy. And that's really important um, if you want to make a lot of money in the game. You want to set up some of these businesses and, and get, your, get your income flowing. Because the blacksmith, of course, what we have here, it's, it's crafting. This is a new feature. We, we, okay. we showed this a little bit last year, but now we get to make a weapon uh, live. Um, what would you like us to make? And we can show you a few different options here. This, we have this full of like our melee weapons right now. This feature is lovely and it's so mountain blade as well because every part fits everywhere. Uh, we have different options we can randomize here and just nice. see different swords. And yeah. the combinations we have is, is millions. Yeah, I mean this um, you know, blade and sword type presumably has a direct bearing on how those things play and what they're appropriate for. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, I mean, we we can have any different kind of parts, so it's like blade, handle, uh, blade guard, handle and pommel for the swords. And so like, you can like, any part fits with any different kind of part as well, so it's like fully customizable. And um, of course the different parts have their own physical properties, right? So we're making rather, a rather sort of very Mountain Blade-esque sandbox yeah. calculation when it comes to it. We can, right. we can sort of optimize things for reach, and we can sort of scale the blade up as well. We have like that kind of, that, that other control. Um, we can go for <laughs> scale a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're gonna make a sword and we're gonna bring it into battle and kill some Vlandians. Yeah, yeah okay. So what kind of weapons should we make? Can we make like a, like a bastard sword? Yeah, like yeah a sword? Yeah. Uh, 200. Or like a, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. One Let's go two. for it. Yeah. And so you, yeah, you can go for like uh, reach, speed, or whatever, or, or you can just like you can try and balance things out to get like the, the best of both worlds. I think it would only be appropriate to set every single slide at the maximum. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's do that. Maximum okay. sword. Maximum, maximum sword. sword. But we can call it maximum sword as well. That's right, completely possible. It. Okay, let's max everything we have. <laughs> uh, we have one more left. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Wait, this guy. Okay. So let's name it Maximum, maximum, sword. maximum sword. And then we can, uh, we're obviously going to take this with us in the battle. We can use it to fight. And it's, um, if you can type it out. <laughs> Turkish keyboard. Yes, of course. Okay. All right. Worth every penny, worth every dinner. <laughs> yeah, worth every dinner. Um, we can also take a look at this as well in the inventory. We have like much more um, control. We can we can inspect items, nice. take a good look at things. It's all just like uh, we just thought about what the player needs and what the player wants from the UI and yeah. just try to do it. You know, we've really really improved on on, on warband and delegating that aspect. I think. All okay. right. I guess that's the sort of affected by the fact that we slid everything to top. Yes, ab absolutely, okay. absolutely everything. It's heavier, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, so you can go for the one which you think looks nice, nicest, or you can you can really focus on the stat side of things as well. Right. It's, it's totally up to you. All right, so we have our party, we have our men, we have our, our maximum sword. <laughs> and um, what we're going to do now is head towards the Vlandian, uh, Vlandian Empire, and we're going to find a lord on the border, and we're, gonna, we're just going to have a big fight with him, basically. Great, sounds good. Of course it does. <laughs> this is like a staple of the game, right? Yeah. It's a huge battles. Uh, before we do that, we're going to speak to an allied lord, though, first. And, and uh, what we're going to do is get him to follow us, because we're, we're still a sort of reasonably uh, small party. We have like 60-odd people, so we have the, the appropriate name Gawig there. He's a real veteran of the faction, you can tell. He looks really happy. <laughs> yeah. 
He's showing off, perfectly showing off our facial asymmetry that yeah. we have in the game as well. This yeah, is yeah. the total option we have that we added into the game. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, oh, um, one thing to mention here as well, you can see on the screen right now, so this dialogue option has the uh, the 100i factor. This is like a new currency we've had in the game, it's called influence. And so what it is, it's like the power you have to, to request things from other lords in your faction. So by doing things and uh, completing tasks in your faction, you know, following armies, fighting in battles, uh, you gain influence, and sort of by being a sort of uh, a high-ranking lord as well, you get influence gradually and it accumulates, and you can use this to do various things like get lords to follow you, and. Um, uh, and sort of command, uh, it's, it's like an IOU, I suppose, right. really. Uh, and you, you earn that and then you can spend it in a, in a sort of a direct way. So now he's following us on the map where we go. Uh, they're happy to follow us for a couple of days at least. Uh, but they will eventually say, like, you, we need you to do something before. Yeah, yeah, yeah of yes. course. And if they're like busy with something else as well, they'll just like, probably reject it. Right. So we're going to find the Lord uh, from another faction. And he would be here in the outskirts of the other faction which we are at war at, Vlandia. We're gonna try to uh, defeat him in a large battle. Okay, yeah. let's see how this goes. Just gonna wait for daylight. All right. So this is a uh, Ekerup, and um, he's a Vlandian lord. He's got a <laughs> great face, <laughs> and uh, he, he, you can see because he's an enemy lord, he's already quite hostile. Um, but at the same time, um, we slightly outnumber him, so he's not actually gonna try and directly engage us. We're gonna have to deliver our terms to him, and we're the aggressor in this fight. So let's just uh, let's just provoke him. We don't care. Yield or fight. We will we'll force his hand and uh, go straight into his battle. So we, we saw that screen before, but uh, now it, now it sort of uh, uh, sort of comes into its full purpose a little bit more. We got we got information about both parties, uh, the total number of troops. And we can see which different parties are involved in the battle as well. So uh, when you have sort of a large battle with multiple parties involved, you want to see all the troops and all the kind of more, more information so you can make a better decision and plan out your strategy beforehand. Um, we give you that information now with our with you Okay. All right, so we into the battle. A little bit, so... Uh, so this is like... Uh, wait, that's... Don't... <laughs> Chris, let's see it. Let's go. Let's go. You good? Yeah. Okay, so um, obviously, you know, in large battles, they're, they're, they're a staple of Mountain Blade, right? And obviously we have more troops than we've ever had in, in any game, uh, any of our games before. Uh, but in addition to that, we've really tried to make sure that they are um, interesting, um, you know, varied, and exciting every time as well. <laughs> so we've got our new armor there we're wearing. What's your what's your uh, what's your game plan here? All right, let's first sort of scout charge. a little bit and see what the other guys are doing. Our opponents, uh, you can see them, um, and. Um, the defensive player, Ekaran, so he's of course, he wants the high ground and he doesn't need to come further to us uh, because he is the defender and we're the attacker, so uh, I'm going to have to come to him if I want to battle him. So, so what we do is we know we've got, we've got much more advanced AI working here, they, they look for high ground, they hold that, uh, they don't want to give it up easily, so it's going to be sort of on us to find a way of approaching and assaulting him um, uh, and this sort of difficult defensive position that he's, he's set up for himself. Uh, we have much more sort of detailed command options as well. We can we can sort of create formations by dragging them on the world map, uh, the, or the game map, sorry. Now uh, we have some pretty decent troops as well. A little bit hanging, so our strength is really in our in our in our longbowmen. But at the same time, we've got a, a good uh, core of cavalry. You can see Gowig there, along with the the horseman front. Because he's following us, that that makes us the commander of the battle yeah. this time. So uh, in previous uh, playthroughs in the demo. Uh, We've gone from the right, I'm gonna go from the left this time. Let's okay. try something new, I never, I never tried uh, another tactic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping uh, we will win. You can see Ekron as we move around, he's, he's sort of changing his formation. He's changing yeah. to face us and make sure that he's ready for, for whatever we do. The first day I died, uh, but that actually <laughs> was great because it gave us the uh, opportunity to show off another feature which we have. The, the battle continues well, Let's hope we though, die again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The battle continues yeah, that's even though... Probably wrong. <laughs> If I would die, um, my troops, since there are more of them, and if I give them uh, the um, like order of charging, then probably... Dude, you want, you're, you're going you're gonna to get shot in the... You are no, charging. No, no, well. okay, you you want to get back. What yeah, are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to put all my men here. Let's see? Well, this is still mountain blade, so we're still completely uh, vulnerable. Yeah, really, yeah, an arrow in the head is yes. an arrow in the head. No, right? we're not wearing a helmet right now, so this is... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's, there's no, still no fantasy, no, 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 no tricks or, or special um, options for the player. You're, you're still very much in the fight, and it's still like 
Every character has its own AI, uh, their own behavior, so you can fight one of them and they'll have a meaningful fight with you because they are they're controlling their own blocks of attacks. Oh, we now we have see. much more develop, developed sort of like grand AI as well, so they're thinking much more tactically about what to do. You can see the AI is uh, always responding to whatever I'm doing when I'm moving my troops, wherever I am. Um, they will change uh, dynamically uh, and, and see what I'm doing. So should we try and, let's try and bait him down off the hill, I think. Yeah, this is a good bit, because if they want to run away later, then we'll have to run upward. Then. So my I think we should send our archers, archers forward. Yeah, yeah and then what we can try and do is, if, if, he, if he spots that they're sort of too far away from the group, he'll recognize that and then and sort of go for a charge. That's, what, that's what we want. Has a yeah, exactly, yeah. that's what we want to do. Yeah. You can see now he's, he's, moving, he's, moving, he's moving some horsemen over here. We're actually having a bit of an archer-archer -archer fight right now. His, his horsemen coming over to, to attack. Yeah, okay, so it looks like we provoked them into a charge now that they're yeah, starting to come down. They're coming down the hill. Uh, <laughs> okay, pull them back. Oh my god, no. Get out, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> okay, so we've pretty much sacrificed our archers there. Let's get everyone else to charge in. What are you doing now? Yeah. And so, yeah, okay, our archers, we sort of, we, we pretty much used them uh, rather, rather awfully there, but uh, yes. at the same time, we're now going to ask to give us an opportunity to uh, fight Ekrand a bit off his hill. Um, can we see him with Ekrand? yeah, we can try to take him out. Oh, Where is he? There we go. There, there he is. Let's <laughs> try and track him down. Maximum sword. Maximum sword, yeah. Maximum sword because the Maximum pain. <laughs> So you see the fight is sort of broken out into a full, full chaos now. Yeah, he's um, actually gone to road straight through it and gone to the other side. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> you see he's out of there. There he is. There he is. Tactically passive, individually uh, suicidal. We were. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's really... He's doing alright actually. Yeah, he's okay. We're just trying to take him down. Totally lost them, so we have like interesting other AI um, uh, fixes here as well. So like um, uh, the troops, if, if they are sort of they, they feel that they're being drawn too far away from their formation, they'll like run back into it and they'll feel like they need to self-preserve and right. kind of stay alive. So they won't just break break up the formation for no reason. No, exactly. Uh, but obviously, if we send archers forward, they pretty much have to follow that that command. And, yeah. Uh, Even if they are all going <laughs> they, to die. they were like lambs to the slaughter essentially. Yeah. Okay, so we're doing we're doing pretty okay. I think I think the the, the slight number of ones we had and the, the troops that we had. Well, you can you spend your number. <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, I, I think we're, that's just about seeing us through. We have a 200 sword as well, so the shield looks yeah. good. I think we're doing okay, yeah, are we? Uh, that arrow looks painful, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Where's he gone? Oh, Lord. Ah, here he is. No, that's not him. No, he is. Ekron might have been taken out, actually. We can, we can bring up the tactical screen and see exactly how things are going. Ekron is uh, still alive. Ekron is still alive. Yeah. Oh my god. Well, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, we have like a trans. Uh, uh, amount of improved physics as well in the game. You know, it's a brand new engine, so we, we can do much more interesting things. We have like, um, you know, like horses uh, will sort of like push you to one side, whether even if they don't go over, you feel like the weight of, of various uh, sort of tactical um, approaches. So like it, like a big uh, heavy formation of infantry, they will be like essentially pushing the enemy forward as well. So you really feel like the weight of like um, you know, using these formations and using them effectively, essentially. This is going really well. Yeah, it has yeah, gone really well. Was, I, think, I think our trips have been amazing. Make the switch literally. Like, yeah. <laughs> I always thought spending your archers' lives simply to get a man off a hill wasn't worth it, but you proved me wrong. <laughs> we'll have to recruit some more, I think, later. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yes. So, obviously, our, our troops are now accelerating, and uh, we've got an arrow to the, to the elbow. <laughs> he doesn't, he really doesn't look like he might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so we get, we get some information we sort of brought up a second ago about the battle and what, what happened. We can see how many kills all of our different kind of troops has got, so we get more like detail here about, about uh, which of our troops are effective and, and, and we get more feedback about how the fight has gone. I think you lost as it does. See how I did. I, I killed two people. Oh yeah, they got knocked out. Gawig, Gawig, he took someone down. It's not bad. Good old Gawig. We did well. Like, that, that one trained infantry we killed 17 people. Our battalion footmen were very... No, that's just like, that's, that, that's, oh, all, that's the, the whole troop. Okay, that's like one guy, holy hell. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. So um, we, can we can, of course, again now uh, we get to take them prisoner. Ekerin got away. Yeah. Um, but obviously, if we take him once again, we we can uh, we can use him, uh, ransom him, make some money, mm -hmm. and because we have like more interesting and detailed uh, like political mechanics in our game. So what we can do is we can take Ekerin and we can uh, not just ransom him, we can try and ransom him to a family member or something. We can we can try and make more money by by sort of using the, the, the politics that works within our game. And um, we can specifically do that and, and it will, the game will respond to it and give you an interesting result as well. Okay, fantastic. Nice, okay. <laughs> 
Yeah, this is good, I think. Yeah. Nice. That looks more safe. Yes, yeah. Okay. All right, brilliant. So uh, Ekron is defeated, and, and obviously this is going to help advance the battalion war effort, right? Because now Ekron, uh, he could potentially, um, he's feeling more pressure from his faction to, to do well because he's not he's not able to support our army anymore. So he might have to like really tax his peasants, and right. uh, that's going to cause him problems later down the line because they might revolt, and then he, he sort of it's essentially it's going to cause him problems if he wants to improve and advance in his faction. You know, if he's thinking of becoming like marshal or whatever. Yeah. Um, He's not going to be able to influence the other lords to do that if, if he's having to sort of rebuild his, his forces and, and uh, you know, drive his peasants to exhaustion. It's cool that his defeat doesn't simply mean, oh, you beat him. It's, it no, has a big impact on the simulation as Absolutely, well. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more, more deep the way that everything is really interconnected in this game as well. I mean, you know, we could, we could go and uh, find his village and we can, if, if he doesn't stop us, of course, kill every single peasant that comes from his village to his town. And then and that's going to just really starve out his economy and really cause some problems. And you'll see that in his army as well. He'll have weaker troops, fewer troops, and, uh, and he'll just be put under much more pressure as a result of that as well. Okay, so that's, uh, that's everything we have to show for the, for the time being. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Yeah, that, yeah it's, it's really interesting seeing how, how far the simulation has got. Because the game looks a lot better, but it's still familiarly Mountain Blade. It is, yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. a fundamental level. But the most exciting changes to me, at least, maybe chat feels differently, seem to be taking place in how much that economic simulation <laughs> <laughs> Chat's great. I, mean, I don't know what they Yeah, okay, cool. But like, how much the economic simulation is, is actually powering like the, the war effort, mm -hmm. the strategic side of it as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really important. I mean, like, uh, and you sort of, um, you feel it as well in, in sort of, uh, in what happens with trade, because if you're, if you're sort of uh, too much in war, you're also missing out a lot of trade as well. So you, you, like, you need to make sure that your, your faction is making good money, because that's how you, like, you know, the laws have the same constraints that the player do. And they have to pay the wages, they have to feed their army, and they have to do everything that the player does uh, in order to actually maintain a, a good, strong force. So everything else is really important. Um, you know, all the cogs of their economy are really important to be working for them. Given that, I mean, you, you showed, what you showed us is like mid-late game sort of status for the player. Is yeah, I mean, to say? Like, I would say it's like uh, mid-game very much. I mean, we have the, the first stage before you become like a vassal or, or a noble, right. and then you have like the noble stage, and then if you if you sort of really take it to town, or you can start your own faction and become a king, obviously, of course, in this game as well. Is, um, is the intent to kind of get players to that status a little bit quicker? Cause my, I mean, anecdotally, my experience of Mountain Blade is often that I spend a lot of time with that kind of early level, kind of like as a sort of very minor player. No, not that that's I mean, bad, but no, like... Yeah, I mean, bit, yeah. well, the, the thing is, like, uh, you, you can just play it how you want to play it, right? You, you can start off and become a criminal, and you can, you can sort of uh, take any sort of approach you want to sort of power and money to success. Um, but we have tried to engineer it in a way that you can, if you want to get to that stage, there's sort of, there, are, there are smarter and faster ways to get there as well. Um, one thing we have is like a main storyline now, and kind of one of the goals of this is, in addition to sort of building up the lore of the game and, and like telling the players more about the, the world of Kairadia that we've created, it's also to sort of um, introduce the players to the mechanics and sort of uh, drive forward some early early game progress if you want to go that route as well right. with, the, with the main storyline. So, like, you guys are at this stage, and it seems pretty advanced, like in terms of how how much of the game and the core gameplay of Mountain Blade you're, you're able to show today. Like, what's next for you as developers, and kind of like what's next for the game generally? In terms of what we're going to be showing? Yep, showing, building, making, um, talking about. Right, uh, well, of course. Siege, you know, we're going to be coming with Siege uh, very, very soon. Um, we're, 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 doing, dying, we're, sure we're doing very, we're doing very exciting things, and yeah. it's super cool. I mean, we already we've talked a bit about it, and, and some of the pictures are in it, but um, we, you know, we can't wait to just show off a Siege and, and, and have it look great and everything. You know? um, yeah, that's what I'm Given that uh, you know, chat has been very vocal about when they get to see Bannerlord, <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like I have to ask, when are they going to get to see Bannerlord again? Hopefully, I mean, we're aiming to give it to the players in some shape or form this year. This year. Sometime this year we want to have it in player sounds. That, that's what we're shooting for. Okay. I mean, it's not it's not a promise, but we, that's what we really would love to do. Absolutely. Sort of hypothetically, would you be putting it into player sounds early? Yeah, potentially. That's what we're thinking okay. about. I mean, right. we, we there will probably be some kind of testing at some point. Cool. Great. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Can we just say... Um, of course, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Obviously, thank you to PC Game for having us at the event. It's been great. We've loved it. Uh, but we also want to say, um, you know, thank you to all the all the players and for your enthusiasm and stuff like that. We're, yeah. we're, we're excited to see your reaction as well. And uh, enthusiasm is always great for the game. We, we really do appreciate uh, all the support we have from our players. They're they're, they're great. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks for them. And very yeah. handsome, you know. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks to our players. Uh, I mean, the game uh, the game project started with only two people, and over the years it has grown into a larger company. And we're here now, and it's it's all thanks to the player base. So we 
I just want to say really thank you all. Yeah. No, thank you guys for being patient and waiting for this to be on stream because, you know, I was really looking forward to seeing it too, but so glad to have you guys on and to oh, add this opportunity to like see the game for the, for the first time. So yeah, Sam Frank, enjoy the rest of your show. I guess you're done now. You can go yes. and roam the show yes. floor and enjoy it. I think so. uh, I'm done as well now, which is nice. We're all done. Oh, brilliant. Actually, I'm not done. I've got to go down and do a Q&A. <laughs> so I'm not done at all. But there, anyway, what are you going to do? But it's still nice. And if you tuned in for the live stream over the both days that we've been doing this, all the developers we've been talking to in different games we've seen, thank you very much for watching. This was the PC Gamer Weekender, and I can't think of anything else to say. So. Bye and thanks for watching.